Yo, what's up? This is On Track with DJ Traction and my good friend and co-host, Mr. Foxy Jackson. <laughs> yep, you have you can't even butt in to try to correct that or use your actual name. <laughs> it, it's funny because I was actually saying earlier that I think probably one person in my life, my girlfriend, calls me Eric and it doesn't sound weird. Like, sometimes people call me Eric and I'm like... Oh, that's me. Because oh, everyone calls me like Eric Fox Jackson or EFJ or Fox Jack, like whatever they want to, other than just Eric. I, don't know, I just, can't just say Eric. I just think uh, every time I say your name, it makes me think of the Jimi Hendrix song, and I like I say it to that tune, like in my head, like Foxy Jackson, and like, and then the chords hit. But um, <laughs> anyway, we're here today with an awesome guest. Uh, Rebecca O'Donnell, who is wait well, you you go for it. You introduce yourself. I'm Rebecca O'Donnell. I'm the author of the memoir Freak, the true story of an insecurity addict. And I should just have you like read the whole book right now. <laughs> I'd make an awesome podcast. <laughs> just just that, sneak yeah. the audio book in there. <laughs> this would just be a 400 hour podcast. <laughs> yeah. right. How how long did the recording end up being for the for the audio? Seriously, book? almost 400 yeah, hours. It's something really ridiculous. Long. Wow. Only though because we did get halfway done and we had to start over. Oh. I don't remember exactly why. I think it was excess room noise mm -hmm. that was just too much. Um, or yeah, and it was like, uh, it, it was just something, a minor adjustment that was like, damn, we should really do this all over again. <laughs> because if we kept that half and then did the second half with that adjustment, it was a little too obvious. Yeah. And I was like, nah, fuck, we got to do it again. <laughs> Which sucked because <clears throat> you had also finished it. You were recording it at my cousin's house before that. Right. And whatever happened with his computer and hard drive, lost it all or oh. whatever it was. Yep. And so that's why we started doing it. So it probably on your half was almost eight, 800 hours <laughs> of recording time. And then, obviously, you don't hit it all in one take. So Imagine you had to. You just had to do it all in one take. One take COVID. Just, just no, like, I love, I love like when we first started and you told me to stop doing Yeah. Because I kept smacking noise. my lips when I was talking. I had a real... It was a real sense of, I think that's actually what it was, too. I think we changed mics. I had two different mics. You did change and mics. And that's... I had one condenser that was, like, omnidirectional, picked up sound from everywhere. We were in the basement, and it would pick up sound from, like, the kitchen. <laughs> like, it was super sensitive. And then I had one that was more a directed mic, and I was like, this is the one we should be using. And then we switched to that, and it did make a big difference. Yeah. So... And is it, uh, is it unabridged? Like, if you have the book... And then you get the audio book. Are you going to be getting like more? No, it's the whole book. Because, it's, but is it, it? Do you ever go off on like non sequiturs or anything about the? Things no, we reading? just straight read it. Yeah, it is, it's word it. for word. Although, that might be a good idea for like a remix audio book. <laughs> yeah, because right. no, we already uh, had the book done, so it's not like you have to re-record it. We right. could just play it, stop it, and have you comment like looking back at it or whatever, or like looking back from now and kind of maybe. Um, expanding on some of it a little more. Yeah, right. because you know? I think uh, Mindy Kaling's book, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, I started listening to that, I was on a plane, and they had, like, audio books and movies and stuff, so I started listening to that, and uh, I think it was, like, unabridged. I think since she was doing, since she was reading her own book, she was also adding stuff to it, and it, it's, it was a really, of what I heard, it was really good, and I actually had been meaning to buy it. It was really funny. She's really funny. Yeah. I was, um, like, I wanted to definitely ask you about stuff that happened in the book, but I also want be people that might be listening to this, like, before they go to bed to, like, be able to sleep at night, <laughs> so I'm not sure which story to ask you about, but one of my personal favorites from it, um, was, like, the art teacher that you had in Everybody high says that. That... Everybody loves the story about the art teacher. Because, with, with everything that's in that book, and... Really, we told you last time to find it on Amazon or wherever and to read it. I mean, I guess you could wait for the audiobook to finally be live, which will happen soon. Um, but there's some stuff in it that you're just not going to believe. You're like, how does, how does somebody go through all these events well, and come out fairly okay? You're right. a very like, well-adjusted person. So. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, neither, <laughs> I'm neither serial killer nor crack whore. So it's, yeah, you know, so that's, it's, it's a, nice that's a win. Class, right? It's a win. Well, yeah, when I used to um, teach art therapy at the abused children's home, that was the weird thing about me. The kids, I had never been in jail. I had never been on drugs or booze or anything like that. I wasn't a sex addict. I wasn't violent, although I was kind of violent when I was younger. But um, 
So I was something for them to look at that was unusual. You know, because with my background with the, you know, CSA, the child sexual abuse, plus the physical abuse, plus, a, uh, you know, mental, emotional abuse, everything. I was actually a very mild case, and I'm still a very mild case compared to most CSA people that I, that I talk to. I'm a very, very lucky person compared to, to them. That's... But uh, these kids, I would teach these kids, and I was confusing to them because when you're in that, when your daddy's fucking you and your brother and his friends are fucking you and everybody's beating you, you think that that's going to be your life. That's your future until you die. As an adult, you're going to be, you know that you're going to be messed up. You know that you're going to have all sorts of problems and you think that that's your only future. So they would look at me and they'd be like, what, what, who are you? And why are you smiling? Why are you happy? Are you faking it? And then they would see I wasn't faking it. You know, they're like, well, are you just crazy? A little bit. Yeah. And I you think know? it would be interesting if all sorts of authority figures, like when, when you were introduced <clears throat> to like all of your teachers throughout general education, if they had to tell you about like the life that they led before that, because as a teacher, like myself, a lot of people aren't going to know all the things that I've been through and how actually very similar I am to them. But for the most part, I can't really tell them that I used to, you know, get in tons of fights and like do tons of like horrible things, like do lots of like drinking under bleachers and stuff like that. <laughs> and so in turn, they're, they, like you said, like they're not going to have a higher expectation for themselves because they think of themselves as only this Right. This is my only future. It's already set because I'm already ruined, so why should I try? And what, you know, the way I look at it, everybody's as individual as their own fingerprint. Do you think that your own experiences in your own life and your own mind are less intricate than your fingerprints or less unique? It's kind of like the great line from uh, Hamlet where the guys are trying to, um, you know, pull one over on Hamlet. And he hands one of them a flute. And he says, play me a tune on this pipe. And they're like, well, you know, we, we don't know how, never learned. And he goes, come on, come on, it's got to be easy. Go ahead and play me a tune. And they're like, we've never learned. And he said, do you think I am easier to play than this pipe? <laughs> Which is like the coolest comeback of all That's time. That's such a gangster line. <laughs> I, know. This is, I know. This is why Hamlet is the most quoted of any of Shakespeare's plays, because it's just packed full of lines like that. I feel like some of that ties into what we were talking about before, we pretty much had a whole podcast before we started. <laughs> press, before I pressed record on this, we kind of had a whole podcast off air. But um, about like perspective and how you see things different when you get older, um, especially for students and seeing their teacher as someone who is exactly like them pretty much, you know, and have gone through very similar things growing up and to get to the point that they had. I definitely, looking back as a student, definitely didn't think about that of that of any of my teachers. Even when we had fairly new teachers right out of college that are a lot closer to your age, never really saw them as, oh, this is somebody who just who's done everything that I've done pretty yeah. much, you know? Right. You just don't see that until you, again, you get to a certain age and you realize everybody is the same, quote-unquote, and nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> like, right, that's exactly nobody right. really has a clue. It. And yeah. for, the most part, for the most part, everybody has seen some shit. You know, like a lot, like most people have been through something crazy. And if you were able to, without getting in horrible amounts of trouble being the teacher, if you were able to relay that information to people, I think a lot more people would feel safe in this world. You know, like they would feel comfortable knowing that they've had the problems and the same people that are giving them instruction had and that, you know, the people that you may look up to had. That's why I think something like this is great. Um, Just being able... To freely talk, you know, right. get stuff out, because there are people out there that are going to hear it and be like, yeah, I've definitely lived through something similar to that, and I like it more that none of us are famous people. <laughs> There's a thousand podcasts out there with a bunch of famous people that start it, and they talk to just other famous people or more or well-known people or whatever it is. Um, I like that it's, we're just regular people, you know, and putting that out there in a, on, in a different tint than how you would normally see them maybe in everyday life it's like it's like yeah that that makes sense like i'm not the only one that feels this way or goes through this or whatever it is and to what you were saying about everybody goes through some bullshit some people it's it's another perspective and context thing too where it's like if somebody's gone through something 
it, it's to their perspective. So when somebody says, oh, my life sucks because of yada, 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 and someone says, oh, but this person did some this that sounds way worse, it's like, yeah, that is way worse, and they got through it. But to that person with their experiences, even though it might not be on a 10 on the scale of 1 to 10 of how hard they've had well, it. to them it is. To them it is, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. why I might... And I think people kind of overlook that. It's, it's all like, it's well, all mine was worse. It's but all it's like, experience yeah. yeah, that's why uh, That's why my sister hates the term first world problem. Well, first of all, that first world relates to a capitalist society and third world relates to a communist society, I believe. But, um... But oh, I thought it was economic. I, yeah, no, it's not actually economic. Huh. It's like an old, like, uh, you know, like, uh, Cold like War. Marketing term. ploy. Oh, wow. And, um, but she also hates because, like, that's almost saying that the, you know, first world problems, quote unquote, that you have aren't real problems, but they're very real to you. And, you know, there's first world problems like depression, you know? Like, if you... If you just have a tough life, technically you're not depressed. You just have a very, very tough life. If you have this, like, very crazy, you know, like, uh, impoverished life, you, you might not be depressed as much as you're just affected by everything going on around you. Whereas, you know, it's kind of, it's almost, you know, I, I went through a period of depression. And to think about it, like, I was almost kind of lucky to be able to just be kind of depressed about nothing like as like a teenager just depressed and if people were like what's wrong i'd be like you know, the, the <laughs> you know that, i don't know <laughs> the thing that kills me the thing that kills me when you know you have some sort of emotional or mental problem is people are like well, why can't you just get over it yeah oh yeah like, well, I, well why don't you just calm down yeah, yeah just get <laughs> happy thoughts. and so i said I said, why don't you get hit by a bus and then get up and dance? And I'm going to say, why don't you fucking get, just get over it? It was just a bus, you know? Because uh, when, it, when, when it's not something physical, you can't see the barricade. So people assume, like, well, don't think that way, you know? Well, there's a, there's a great book called The Three Pound Universe, which is about the human brain. Is that the coolest title? Yeah. I mean, you got a whole universe inside of your head, so you really think that that, that is easier to contain than one little tiny body you know it's ridiculous you've got a whole universe inside your head and everything is inside that head to you and your whole world your whole perspective everything is from that and so you know when people say just get over it i i, I have a friend that i'm i'm uh, helping right now she's um child sexual abuse and um she was raped when she was 12 years old she was talked into going down into a basement and this guy fucked her with a hammer. And which end? Uh, he used both. Uh. Yeah, he tore up pretty bad. To this day, and she's in her forties now. She's a cutter. She's uh, incredibly brave, but she has PTSD. She has all sorts of problems that still comes from this and she was she never really dealt with it she was the way she dealt with it was don't think about it yeah but it's never going to go away if you don't think about it it's like oh don't think about that giant festering wound on your leg don't look at it maybe it's not there maybe pus coming out of yeah it. and it stinks and it's all this it. other kind of stuff you know just leave it alone it'll be all right and that's what happens and you fester and it's real common um for like csa people who live their life this way and they actually seem normal, but you'll see the little red flags like they're obsessive compulsive cleaners. And they're very, very zealous about certain things that they believe. You know, because that's the structure they need to not completely go off the rails and just start, you know, attacking people or scream or killing themselves. And they, they cut themselves in private. They hurt themselves. I know someone who tears their own toenails off. Mm, that's the kind of stuff I can't of, even see in movies. Exactly. Right, oh. right. They, they tear their own toenails off. And um, you see different people react in different ways. Girls uh, tend to do a lot of cutting. And guys seem to do a lot of burning, which is very common. They'll cigarette burn themselves. Oh. They'll, um, like, I like fire. They'll like set, something on, <laughs> they'll set something on fire. They'll, they'll um, do that game where you do the lighter underneath your arm, see how long you can hold it. And, and it's real common, and you really get off on people seeing your wounds. But most people try to hide it. And now that, you know, on Twitter and things like this, people are always posting photos of their wounds and things like this. Now, that's both good and bad. If you're doing it for, like, Munchausen syndrome so that you can get the sympathy, 
then that's bad. If you're doing it to reach out to other cutters and other self-harmers, things like that, I think it's a good thing. I know people who um, will send me personal pictures of where they have just cut the living shit out of themselves. Well, and, those and they've are... just done it, and they want my sympathy. And I'll say, it's very interesting the way you cut. I noticed that you didn't, like this one person doesn't cut deep. Like a lot of time you just do like one cut. I never cut because my fingernails were so thin, I could just claw myself. My whole back looked like, you know, Kurt Cobain's back in that famous portrait of himself where he said his wife was scratching his back because it was, you know, he was itchy from all his heroin. And she clawed his back all up. My back looked like that from me clawing myself. But it's because my fingernails are so thin, they're like razor blades. So I never needed a tool an to cut. An actual razor blade. But, yeah, an actual razor blade. I just used my fingernails. Or I'd hit myself. I hit myself, pinch myself, stuff like this. So um, she did a really weird cut that she sent me, and she's used to people saying, Oh, my God, please don't do that. You're better than that. I have never found that effective to tell someone who does it for the pain and the release and actually likes the reaction of people being upset... I remember a teacher seeing me when I was in high school. I think I was a freshman. No, I was in junior high. I was in seventh grade. And this teacher said, you know, Becky, please don't, you know, don't hurt yourself. You're such, a, you're such a good girl. You're such a good person. And people really love you. You don't need to hurt yourself like this. I just can't stand you being in pain. And I remember looking at her and acknowledging the fact that that was a really kind thing for her to say, that it was really sweet and really nice. And I just took a sharpened pencil and stuck it in my arm. And I stuck it all the way down. And it stuck about half an inch in my arm. And I let it go and it just stayed. And the teacher was so terrified of my doing that that she burst into tears and she ran away. Yeah, I would too. Well, yeah. this is the kind of... This <laughs> I is would the feel like I was in some sort of like... Uh, like is this happening right now? Yeah, we just talked about like, a bunch of horror movies. I'm yeah, like, yeah, exactly, this is how they start. Yeah. This right, is the- right. And I just looked at her and I remember just thinking, what an innocent... Look at her, that she's gone this long in her life, and she's, she's such an innocent. You know, the woman's 15, 20 years older than me, but to me she was an innocent, and that's because she was. You know, it was something that was completely outside of her experience, and I just decided to give her just a taste of what it's like inside my head, and it's terrifying. I rarely show people what's really inside my head because I'm very scary. Like, I, I mentioned a part in the book when my son was a, um, a using drug addict and very violent. And I remember being really scared because with my background, I can handle just about anything except violence. Do not hit me. Do not attack me. Because I'll just lose it. And that's my trigger. That's pretty much the only real trigger that makes me freak. And my son threw me up against the um, refrigerator, and he's 16. And he's punching the refrigerator right by my head, and he's going so close, he's actually just bumping my cheekbone like this. And he's actually hitting my ear. And he's hitting the side of the fridge, and he's just screaming in my face, and he's spraying me with his spit, and he's all crazy. And, I, and I'm just staring at him. And I remember um, kind of, he was kind of proud and cocky like the next day, and he goes, yeah, I could tell you are really scared of me. I could see that you were really scared. And I said, I wasn't scared of you. And he goes, Ma, you were fucking terrified. I saw it on your face. You were scared of me. And I says, yeah, I was terrified, but I wasn't scared of you at all. And he goes, yes, you were. No, I wasn't. And I never told him what I was actually afraid of. What you'd do to him? What yeah. I was afraid of was my hand was going like this across the counter, and my hand was actually on the knife rest. And I just thought, oh, God, don't let him hit me. Oh, my God, don't let him hit me. Because if he hits me, I'm taking one of these knives, and I'm going to stab him, and I'm not going to stop. And I'm going to kill my own kid, and I'm going to call 911 because I just killed my own kid. Don't let him hit me. Don't let him hit me. It was the scariest moment of my entire life because I wanted to. And thankfully, he backed down. But a counselor told me something interesting about that. She says, well, you know what I find fascinating about that? That your son trusted you enough that he thought he could do that. Your son knew your background. He knew what you were like. And he completely trusted that you would not hurt him. And I said, that was a foolish thing for him to believe. And she goes, yes, it was. Did he totally know that? Like, Yeah, maybe he, all, maybe he wanted that. You never know. I mean... Especially being I like, think the he state that he could have been in at that time, I don't. I just don't know if that. 
Was he may have... He, part of the thought process? Yeah, well, maybe part of his pro- thought process was that I would attack him and then he could beat the shit out of me. And then... But not the fact that I could kill him. And I knew that I could really hurt him because the, the, the weird thing about an abused kid is we're not afraid of pain. We don't care. Pain doesn't mean anything. Pain is kind of amusing. It's just pain. The thing that's scary is them coming at you and what they're saying and the memory of what's going to happen. But it's not even so much the fact that, you know, you got vaginal bleeding for three weeks because, you know, your dad stuck his giant dick in your tiny little crotch and you're, and you're ripped up in there. And, uh, you know, you don't really care about that. What you care about is that you were something so disgusting that he thought that was okay. I really think that I really think that the the self hatred mindset. This is why my my subtitle for my book is the true story of an insecurity addict. I think that negative emotions and negative feelings like that are an addiction. I think they're a addiction, and um, I think that it you know may have something to do with mammalian imprinting, because when a, a mammal is born it imprints immediately on its parent and it instantly obeys the parents. You can see a baby fawn is born and will instantly obey the mother. The same day the mother can put the fawn in one spot, tell it to stay there, and it will stay there and not move until she comes back. It it can be hours and hours and hours later and it will obey. It's a survival instinct. So think about it. If you're a little kid and one of your parents is beating you, or they're both beating you, they're calling you these terrible names, they're raping you, they're doing whatever, you are going to believe what they say and what they do because it's instinct. And I think that's one of the reasons that it is so hard to dislodge the self-hatred is because it's almost like a survival instinct that's gone haywire. You're supposed to obey the, the adult, the parent, because the parent keeps you alive. But if your parent is doing things that are almost killing you, or in many cases actually is killing you, you're still going to obey. Even if it's in your head, you're going to obey. Well, also, a lot of times you don't even know at those ages that that's not okay. Like, yeah. that other people right. don't, that's just not normal. Like, right. you don't realize that that's not normal. That That becomes your reality, and you just feel like, well, that, this is what life is, I guess. And Well, what's fascinating about my um, traumatic amnesia, and I had the traumatic amnesia, that's why I first started to go see a counselor. I have a whole year of my life for, between eight and nine that I didn't remember at all. Now, I remember patches of it now, but that was because of therapy and actually trying to remember. There's still patches I don't remember, which I'm sure beyond description because the stuff I remember is pretty bad. But I remember my, my teenage brother and his four buddies, so I think it was five of them total, they would take me out to a barn out in the middle of nowhere in southern Illinois and um, gang rape me. And I didn't remember that they did that, but I re- the stuff that I did remember, I remember they would put on the song, They're Coming to Take Me Away, Hee Hee, Ho Ho, Ha Ha, which was the flip side of that. Remember that song? It was a one-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people leader. <laughs> yeah. It was on the flip side of that. And my brother would play that song somewhere in the house. Once my, both my parents were gone, my mom went to work, and then they would come after me. And my mom always thought they were so sweet because they babysat me for free. And they're like, boy, you know, your sister's a pretty little girl. She's a pretty little girl. And, um, and my brother that protected me was already dead, so there was nobody to watch me. And um, they'd put that song on, and I distinctly remember I was raising tadpoles in a mixing bowl in my room. And I didn't have an aquarium and I didn't have any kind of oxygenation. So I would blow through a straw, blow water and or, uh, oxygen into the water. And it worked, the tadpoles lived, but they're air bubbles anyway. And so they had little legs and I had a little rock that they were climbing on. And that song came on. And I immediately, it was in my parents' bedroom that that bowl was, why they let me have it in there, I don't know. And I crawled underneath the bed. Now, the bed was not a normal bed. It was very, very low to the ground. So I actually had to turn my head sideways just to get under. And I was a little tiny skinny kid. And I'm hiding under there, and I see their feet. And then they lifted up the bed, and there were dust bunnies under the bed, and they they puffed like that when they lifted it up. And then the two guys grabbed me and yanked me out. 
And I remember fighting so hard, I tore the wallpaper on the wall as they were pulling me out. And they got me outside, and they threw me in their car, but they couldn't put me in the back seat until one of the guys went around to the other side to hold me because I had fought so hard. And then they get me in there, they slam the door, and I don't remember anything after that. But then later that day, I remember my brother, who was part of the gang, taking me in the bathroom and pulling hairbrush out, uh, hair out of my hairbrush. And, and he goes, he says, look what happens when you burn hair. And he lit the hair on fire, and you know, it goes up like that, and it does that horrible stink. Yeah. And he goes, remember that smell, remember that we did this. I go, okay, do it again. And when some of my memory came back, I remember them putting cigarettes out on my head. And my brother goes, no, man, mom will see. And his friend goes, fuck you. And he's flicking the, the ash on the end of the cigarette so it's nice and red. And they lifted up my hair in the back like this, and they, they stuck it on. And so that's why he did that. So I would remember the smell of burning hair and remember it in the bathroom, not from what they were doing to me. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating, horrifying puzzle that I'm putting together, trying to get these things. And what I really am happy about is, is somehow, I, I consider myself pretty much the luckiest person that I've ever met because I had these things happen to me. And my siblings, my grandparents, my parents, my aunts, uncles, cousins, they're all drug addicts, criminals, violent, all this other kind of stuff, and I'm not. Why? I'm probably some genetic anomaly, but I'm not mean. I'm not a drug addict. I, and now I use my past to help these brothers and sisters, a circumstance of mine, every day. What, what's really interesting to me is, basically, I would say before, just and what you just said, how you came out. Like, <laughs> no, you know, like, you're, you're not any of that. Why the fuck am I not and, like that? And not only not, it's almost to the, all the way to the extreme, because, I mean, you still, like, talk to your dad and stuff, like, right. the stuff that he's going through now, like, you seem generally concerned about it and stuff like that, where some people, I, f I feel like most would be like, you know, fuck that dude, you know what I'm saying? Right. And not have anything to do with them ever again. Well, you know what I think helped with that, though? I was always curious as to why my parents were monsters. I asked my dad when I was in my early 20s, I said, what made you a monster? And he didn't say, what do you mean, or get upset or anything. He, he's also a weirdly fascinating, completely fucked up monster. But he goes, I said, you, you were, I said, monsters are usually not born, they're made. What happened to you to make you what you are? And he starts telling me. And I mean, stuff make your hair curl, just awful, awful shit. And he didn't even recognize the fact that he was raped as a kid. Five years old, every Sunday at the family cookout, his cousins would take him in the barn and rape him. And he's describing it to me, and he goes, he says, and, and they were girls, they were teenagers, and their father and brother were raping them, and so they decided to do it to this little boy. And, uh, and he said, you know, he says, it just don't make no sense, you know, old redneck. I mean, he, he didn't even finish high school because his father kicked him out of the house when he was, I don't know, 12 or 13. And he, he actually literally slept in a doghouse in the neighbors down the hill because he didn't have shelter. But uh, I asked him, I said, what happened? And, and he said, I was actually crying. Can you believe that? He says, they were good looking girls. He says, these two big girls. He says, take me in the bar. And he says, and they're both doing me. And he goes, and I... I cried, Dad. They had to hold me down. I was fighting. I said, uh, yeah, Dad, they were raping you. No. Oh, uh, yeah, Dad, they were raping you. No, they weren't. You, you, you got to have a dick to rape somebody. They, they thought I was really cute. And they I'm thought. like, yeah, exactly. That's what he thought. He was proud. He says, yeah, I got my, I got my cherry popped when I was five. <laughs> Beat that record. And I said, uh, Dad, you don't get your cherry popped <laughs> when you're five. You're, you're sexually molested. And one of the really fascinating things about him was... This is years ago when my kids were little. He took us out to Bonanza, which is a smorgasbord place. And my kids went to go get their food. And I had said something to them. And Dad and I were sitting there. And he's looking at me real strange with this half smile on his face. And I said, what? And he goes, God, you're a good mom. I never would have thought you'd be a 
worth a damn as a mom, but you're a really good mom. And he goes, I wish you were my mom. And I looked at him and I said, I said, well, Dad, you sucked as a dad. I mean, you were, I mean, you were a monster. I said, but you were better than your dad. I said, which is terrifying. Which is, yeah. I said, your dad was the worst thing ever. And I said, but you were better than him. I said, Frank is better than you. Not by much, but he's better than you. I said, I'm better than Frank. I said, if we keep this trend going, I said, I think child abuse is going to be out of our family. And by, maybe by the year 3,025. Right. I know. <laughs> I said, in like maybe two or three generations. My dad burst out crying there in the, in the restaurant. He had to run into the bathroom. And I'd only seen my dad cry twice before. But he burst into tears at that. He goes, do you, really, do you really think so? And I said, yeah, I really do. And he burst into tears and ran out. So isn't that wild? And it makes you really wonder, you know, I mean, like the motivations for all these things and just like the, what was learned like at a young age and like what like things were just like kind of imprinted on him at a young age Correct. that he like just as like I, you know it's almost like you said like you you are going through this world and you have no idea what you're doing you know like you're figuring it out as you go along and i wonder how much of that for him was like was i mean in part that like him not even realizing like what he was doing and the actions he was taking only just reflecting on what he had learned and what had been done to him well it's also interesting because what he did to my brothers and me and probably my sister were was terrible but nothing compared to what was done to him so he probably thought he used to always say when he would beat my brothers almost unconscious and make them beat on each other and do all sorts of awful things to him he said well you gotta make him a man i'm like how's that making him a man well, you know, you got to toughen them up. I said, did it work with what your dad did to you? Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm tough as shit. <laughs> and he is tough as shit. He's the toughest fucker in the world. I mean, unbelievable. And they you know, apparently at the uh, uh, local union, because he was an iron worker for like, since he was 14 to retirement. He early retired at 55. So he was an iron worker, a construction worker for that entire time. And at the local union, they still tell stories about him. They sit around and they tell stories about how tough my dad was. It's it, it's weird though, like even when you say that you're talking to him at like just even twenty years old or whatever mm -hmm. about that stuff and him being able to talk about it there's like a, a conscious realization of, to him, like at what point do you think that he knew like or if at any point did he know like that shit was not good. <laughs> like, he always knew it was wrong. All right. He always knew it was wrong. As far as I can remember, as a little kid, you know, we were raised very Catholic. Um, he said, I'm going to hell. I used to have nightmares about me walking around in heaven as a little girl, and there'd be a big hole in heaven, and I could look down and see him, you know, getting poked by devils. And I remember being so horrified by that, I would jump in the hole just so I could try to push the devil away to stop burning him and poking him. And, uh, but he used to, yeah, he, he said, I know I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. I've done evil things. I'm an evil person. I'm going to hell. And he was proud of it. He bragged about it. It never had, he never had any intention of stopping. He took his abuse. That's a fascinating thing about people who are abused and then they embrace it and then they go for it. You either become an abuser yourself or you find an abuser to abuse you. And that's the usual pattern. I mean, I was married to two abusers. One was a real deviant sicko, and one was just a bastard. And um, they almost want to outdo in a cleverer way. And then they justify it. I, I, I remember reading this one thing where this trailer trash fucker was raping his daughter from infancy. And when she was six years old, he started raping her toddler sister. And that's when she decided to tell, because until that happened, she did the usual belief of, I'm a piece of shit, I'm to blame, I'm the one who did it. That's why he's doing it just to me. But when she saw him do it to her sister, she told the teacher. Yeah, she was so like, they, there's no way she's a piece of shit. She's that's three right. months old. Like. Right. And so they arrested him. And as they were taking him out, he was quoted as saying, in disgust, I don't know what's happening to this country. It's getting to where you can't raise your own fuck anymore. 
That's just insane to me. Like, I just, I really wonder what's going on in people like that's heads. And, you know, obviously when I hear that people do things like that, like I'm filled with outrage, you know, and you just want to like make sure people like that never exist. And you want to just like get rid of all of them. But in all reality, like all of those people are sick in the head. And like what you were saying before about like your father was abused and then he abused you, like at what point is that just his mental illness that he has now and he's trying to, in some way, I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, rape is about power. And in, no, at what point sex. is he trying to, you know, reclaim that? Um, you know, if he was, you know... Well, yeah, because I guess you would feel pretty powerless being well, in that position as a kid. His past explains it. It does not excuse it. Nothing no, excuses yeah, it. No, yeah, obviously it doesn't Nothing excuse excuses it. Nothing excuses it. But, you know, you, it makes you realize, like, this is a person who, like, needs help, you know? Like, and even well, though they're doing something horrible, like, in all those... Like, we were talking earlier before in our uh, pre-podcast podcast that we did, <laughs> we were talking earlier about Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman killer. Right. And, um, and how he was horribly abused and how he, he actually saw i believe his his uh mother stab his father they were constantly pulling guns out on each other when they were like fighting like it was like to like a, a like gang violence homicidal degree that like the that the violence in his house was and he learned from that and so in turn like we see he he killed more people than he knows how to count but at the same time, like, he's this person who, like, he was affected by something that happened to him and in turn made him sick in the mind. Of course, it doesn't excuse what he did, but at the same time, like, it makes you almost not sympathize but and not understand, but somewhere in the middle that I'm sure the Germans have a very specific... We can see where it for. came from. Well, you know, yeah. it's... You it's fa- yeah, it's, it's can fasc- follow the breadcrumbs. Yeah. What I find fascinating about him is the fact that he never abused his family. That's yeah, what's and that's, that's what, amazing. That's he what amazing. never... He fiercely protected them and kept them innocent because he recognized how important innocence was. I know this one woman who runs a, a, a house for um, uh, abused kids, and I used to teach art therapy there, and she used to have um, really nasty gangs come after her until some of these gang leaders realized that she wasn't full of shit. She wasn't one of these holier than thou, you know, I'm going to basically help people so I can feel better about myself. She really did want to help. And so they, they left her alone, which, and they actually protected her from some of these, you know, real violent parents and stuff like this who came to the house and tried to kick the door down. She would call these gang leaders faster than she would call the cops because the cops didn't want to come to the neighborhood that this place was in. It was really bad. Because of the gangs. <laughs> and the gang, exactly, exactly because of the gangs. And they would come and, and drag these guys off and God knows do what to them. Well, I think, it, to me anyway, there's a, I feel like it's stereotypical of like, like the gangster or whatever that they tend to be protective of their family, like their, whether it's their mothers, their kids, and stuff like that, but, and ha- but have no problem, you know, killing people as part of the job. Right. You know, like, it's that it's business. business. It's the business that we all chose. We, everybody went into it knowing what can happen, and that's what happens when you fuck up. But well, while you're doing that, you don't affect the people that aren't in that, don't have that job. So it would be the kids, you know, wives, whatever it is. And family And members. fiercely protective of those, you know, and then you got the gangs that are like Kaiser Soze and stuff like this that, you know, well, let's just go wipe out the whole family so we can be more badass than anybody, which is, you know, really, really well, horrific. That was an awesome quote, he like, and then he showed the these men of uh, of will what then true I showed will these was. Men or... of will, he showed these men of will what true will is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was just an intense scene. But, um, I don't know, I, I, I remember talking to this young kid who had been um, interested in a gang and he had run around with the gang and it was you know really awful and he was 13 I think 14 and he asked me a strange question once and when everybody anybody asks me any question I always try to just answer honestly I don't say oh how dare you say that or why could you ask that that's stupid if they're asking the question even if it's sarcastically they want to know you know, a question like this is usually not rhetorical. And he asked me, he goes, 
He says, you know, I don't, I don't understand what, you know, why rape is so bad. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I mean, you know, a woman's cunt is made that way. I mean, you're supposed to be able to just stick it in there, right? I mean, it's, they get all lubed up and, you know, I mean, it's not so bad once they're in there, right? And so I, and, and remember, he's a little, he's a little kid. Uh, well. And so I'm thinking, okay, who did he rape? Or what did he see? Or who what raped him? him? Or yeah. who raped him? So I decided just to answer it honestly. And I said, well, did you know that a woman's vagina is made out of the same skin as your lips? And he goes, what? And I says, yeah, the inside of your lip right here. I said, so like if some guy's in a motorcycle wreck and his lips get ground off on the pavement, he, there's no other part on his body to have grafts made to reconstruct his lips. He actually has to have skin donated from a woman's vagina. A woman has to volunteer to give tissue from her vagina to reconstruct his lips. And I said, so. I said, most rapes are done by more than one guy. And I said, and when you're really scared, you're dry as a bucket of sand. And I said, and you don't get lubed up. I said, so if you want to know what it feels like, I said, and this is just physically what it feels like. It's not the terror and the shame and the horror afterwards. I said, which is actually worse because it doesn't heal as well as your body. I said, take your bottom lip. I said, take a, a shucked ear of corn, a dry corn cob. I said, pull your lower lip down and jam that corn cob back and forth against that lip until the corn cob comes. I said, and then see what shape your lip is in. And I said, and that's just from one rapist. Rapes are usually more than one person. And to my shock, this kid burst into tears and ran out of the room. He completely freaked out and ran out. It turns out that he had taken part in an initiation of a girl gang member. You know, when you join a lot of gangs, you're beaten unconscious or whatever. But girls are fucked by every member of the gang. If you've got a gang of 200, 200 guys will fuck you. And usually the girls pass out. A lot of times they go inside out and just awful, awful stuff. And he had taken part in this. And he was just a kid. And, you know, so if you want to know how bad rape is, that's how bad rape is. And I think there there is sort of a thing where people don't understand how bad it is. And um, there's, like... I've, I've noticed, like, there's been a lot of movies lately that, like, make jokes about rape. And the thing is, like, you probably even heard it before when I went to say the word. Like, I stopped. Because, like, I don't want to, like, hear that. And I don't want to, like, say that. So that coming out of my mouth was, like, unnatural for me. And, uh, yeah, so many movies now are making jokes about it. Or, you know, even in, like, in any sense of it. And, uh, I think it's so strange that that's become like a thing and I think it's to the point that people don't really realize one how devastating of a thing it is and how it in my opinion it's different from you know there's dark comedy that relates to death and I think that there's a big difference between dark comedy that relates to death which in in that case the victim is gone and dark comedy that relates to rape and in that case that victim has to live with that and think about that and you know have that in the back of their mind and that's why actually i want to say afterwards that we should put like a trigger warning on this because yeah. people go into this like man last one was funny this well, one's gonna be a gas well, we kind of did at the end of it <laughs> yeah. at the end of that one so they did listen to the last yeah. one um you know that's why i highly recommended that people do seek out your book and even if it's i don't know if you can just read a chapter as a preview it through Amazon or something like well, that. Well, yeah, it's there's there's a sample chapter on Amazon. Yeah, like to, I highly encourage people to to do that first, because um, this is obviously a different my, path than some of the other ones. My, but what is to the to the word rape? Um, it's I don't want to say like desensitized, but it gets used in a way in like just regular vernacular now that has obviously nothing to do. Yeah, people are like, oh, of it. Justin Bieber's on, you're raping my eardrums. It's yeah, like, or if like, okay, you lost in a someone, video game, so yeah. like, oh, that guy just raped me. Well, it's you like, can do like Lenny Bruce, who's, who says words all the time. Remember, he would say all different kinds of words, and he says we should use them all the time so that they lose their meaning. But that was a good idea, but it actually doesn't happen. Well, yeah, it, it loses the meaning to people who it. didn't go through that. Right. You know, like, yeah, to that person, to me, it doesn't mean as much. I could, 
you know, say, like, if we lose a basketball game, damn, we just got raped, I can't believe that happened, or whatever, and it not affect me the same way as it would affect someone who's actually been through that, and they, and they would be like, whoa, 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 that game wasn't shit, you know, and then if they actually chose to tell you what, you know, with your example or something like that, you'd be like, yeah, I probably, that, yeah. I probably shouldn't use that to describe things. Yeah, and I see so many movies now, like, every other Judd Apatow movie and, uh, you know, in that movie where they were trying to kill their bosses or whatever. Horrible bosses? Horrible bosses, it's a great movie, yeah. Though. I don't remember. It, it was all right, but like yeah, there it. was like, there was a running joke throughout it, like, oh, if we went to prison, who would get raped first? And it's like, that's a horrible thing that happens to people who are sometimes that. wrongly accused of what they did. Actually, they go to prison and they get attacked and yeah. they, their life gets ruined. And that's you know, actually that's the percentage of, the highest percentage of rapes is actually more men get raped than women. And it's because of prisons. Well, you know, what's fascinating about that is when you ask men who've never been to prison, what's your biggest fear of prison? It's getting raped. Of course. And it's like, that's how a woman lives every day. They're yeah. walking down the street and it's kind of dark. Men are just scumbags, man. You're always thinking... Because even if it's like, that's the thing, like there's no women around, it's like, Oh, just start raping dudes, man. Well, no, then. Uh, like, women, women will like, rape, too, but, yeah, but... But not in the, not in the not, numbers that not, dude, no, guys not, do. 90%, what is it, 90% of rapists are men? And It's something very and, odd. Well, that's also, that goes back to what you were saying earlier and the way that people consider it, because there's people that will not consider, that say that women can't rape men, which is, which that's is bullshit. ridiculous. Yeah. But also at oh, the... Oh, yes, they can. Yeah, and it's, it's insane. And uh, going back to what you said earlier um, about the people who sexually assaulted you... It, well, they the, raped me. I don't well, use sexually assaulted. They they raped me. Rape is an ugly word. It's an ugly thing, and I use rape. I use rape with my PTSD people who say, oh, that word triggers me. Don't be afraid of a word. It happened. But so, There's nothing you can do about so it. So going back to the people who raped you, um, they, you know, they were people who were all in, like, for most families, it's considered, like, a circle of trust, you know? Like, right. Parents, uh, family members, friends of those family members, and that's the largest percentage of, you know, of just in general sexual assault on women. And that's the thing is women do live with that, that fear constantly when they're walking alone down like a dark, you know, a darkened area that they could, you know, be the victim of a sexual assault at any moment in any way, shape, or form, you know, rape included in that. Where men and, don't seem to think about it that much. And... Unless they're in prison. Well, and also a thing is, is that statistically, it's more likely to be people that are supposed to be people that you trust, as opposed to a situation where, you know, I I don't know the exact numbers, but it's like a gigantic percentage of people that were sexually assaulted in any way by someone, you know, that is six degrees of separation from them, right. as opposed to, you know, just random guy who's it's usually out someone you know. night, you know, yeah, it's yeah. usually someone you, even the people who are sexually assaulted in the middle of, like, parks and things like that, at times it is people that they knew or someone who, you know, was just with them and, you know, followed them in tow home and, you know, did yeah. whatever to them. According to the, the Hather legacy... On uh, rape statistics, it, right with what you just said, strangers account for 4%. 4%. 4%. Right. It's someone w with whom the respondent was in love with, 46%. Someone that the respondent knew well, 22%. Acquaintance, 19 um, Spouse, 9%. And stranger, 4%. And you, well, have, to figure, you, have, you have to figure, of those 4% of people, I bet you a large number of people who are sexually assaulted by a stranger are more likely to... Report it as opposed to a person who's in a situation Correct. where they yeah, think they're, they're you well, know. One of the fascinating things I find with rape victims, incest victims, is the shame. You know, and it's like I said, it's it's. Uh, I said before, I, I said, you know, what kind of a whore am I that they thought that they could do this to me? They don't do it to anybody else. I mean, you don't know that they do it to anybody else. But one of the fascinating things about being abused and being raped is you don't let go of the self-hatred. That's why I think it's an insecurity addiction. It's really fascinating because if anybody told you, anybody else, your kids, your friends, strangers on the street told you they had been raped, you would not see it as their fault unless you were some judgmental fuck. But usually, you do not, you immediately blame the aggressor, the, per the rapist. But when you were raped yourself, you blame yourself. 
That girl I told you who was raped with a hammer, 12 years old, tore apart, still blames herself. And I said, you really think that you're more to blame than the guy who did that to you? Or guys, I should say. It was multiple. And she said, yes. And I'm like, what possible logic? Okay, show me how you think that. Why do you think that? And she goes, if I had never agreed to go down the stairs, I agreed to go down the stairs. And I said, and she says, I, she says, and so I deserved it. I'm a fucking whore. I, des I, I, I deserved it. And I said, if your daughter went down those stairs and they stuck that hammer up her, is she a little whore? She got furious with me. All the whole maternal instincts just went crazy. And I said, now why don't you... And she went on a 15-minute rant with me. How dare I say something like that? She'd kill anybody who did that to her baby. And I said, why don't you take an ounce of that maternal love you have for your daughter and give it to that 12-year-old child who just went down the stairs because an adult said, why don't you come down here? And I said... Even if he showed you his dick and waved it around and said, come down here, and you went down there, you're still not to blame. I said, even if you thought it was consensual, like I know a lot of incest victims where they said it was consensual, and then they're really horrified because they actually had orgasms. Just deal with that kind of shame. Male and female. Can you imagine how you would hate yourself? Most of them don't survive. They kill themselves if they have an orgasm with their mother or father or brother, whoever they did it with, they either very often, you know, go after somebody else and keep the cycle going. There's a reason they call it a chain. Everybody's a link. Um, or they kill themselves. Because the fact that, oh my God, I actually got sexual pleasure out of that. Well, a lot of times that's also a survival instinct because your mind is going, this is so fucking bad, what can we do to make it not so yeah. terrible? Okay, come. Because your body's like, oh, physical, it's physical. Let's do, let's do something to cover this. A lot of times you just go out of your body. I remember um, I would go into my catatonic states and, uh, you know, my brother and his friends would do these things to me. Like, like I said, put the cigarettes out on my head. And I remember just being amused because it didn't hurt. It was just warm. And I thought, how funny that they think they can get to me like this. You just go out and you just watch. And you're not even in there. You know, but afterwards, I'm a whore, I'm dirty, I'm used, you know, oh, how disgusting. And then the real problem is, is like sexual problems. Like I considered myself a virgin, even though I had been raped as a kid, because I'm like, to me, losing your virginity is actually giving it away to someone you want to give it to. It's not just a little piece of skin that rips with whoever sticks their dick in first. And so I didn't have any lovers at all. I, it's usually you become really sexually crazy and you just fuck everything and let everybody fuck you. And I went the opposite route. You're either one extreme or the other. And I was like, no, I'm going to be really careful and really whatever. And, of course, the first guy who did it to me basically raped me, but it was so fast I didn't realize I was being raped. I had bronchitis, and I remember apologizing for coughing blood on his T-shirt while he's pumping away. And, um, but the... The yeah, thing that is, like a real sexy oh yeah, he moment. Was, oh yeah, he was charming. It was great, and uh, oh yeehaw. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of people ask me about sex, especially the child sex abuse victims because or survivors, because a lot of them don't enjoy sex at all. It's just something they do. They get through. Or they have to fantasize some sort of violent, awful something. And then they feel even dirtier because it's like, I can't get off unless I think of something do you, gross. Do you notice if any of them, if they can bring it up to you, talk to their partners about it at all? Or is it no, very... No, 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 no. all with it? Most partners have no idea. Like this woman that I told you about, the hammer, you know, hammer woman. Like every time she starts to go crazy and say really awful things to herself, I'll say, oh, you're doing hammer time to yourself. She's like, oh, you're so gross. But it, it checks her from her abuse. Because she'll go and she'll... She's a cutter ripper. She'll actually cut her own scalp and tear it. And she used to cut her arms and she'd peel the skin. Because she was in a fire when she was a kid. She could use that as an excuse to hide it. But they usually don't tell. I remember one woman I met at this dinner party. All super wealthy people. And I remember you telling me this. Yeah. And um, this woman comes up and... 
and she's just thrilled because she read the book and she's just she's oh my god oh my god and she just gives me this big hug and you know your radar just immediately goes off it's like okay who fucked her and you know and you're holding her hold her and hold her and uh, everybody kind of drifts away and she and I are still standing in this incredible library and uh, and she looks at me she goes I was raped I was raped when I was a kid and it was it was incest and I said well then you and I are sisters in a terrible way and she laughs. She goes, yes, we are. She goes, no one knows. I said, nobody, none of your friends? She goes, none of my friends, even my husband doesn't know. He has no idea. And uh, I remember one, my one friend who had a real hard problem with sex, and she says, I want to enjoy sex with my husband, and he gets frustrated with me because a lot of times I'll jerk away or, you know, I just want him to hurry up and finish, and, and she says, I just, I just don't enjoy it. I'm, I'm just terrified. It always brings her back. And I said, are you violent? Do you think that you would hurt him? And she goes, no. I said, then tie him up. She goes, what? <laughs> and I said, I said, tie him up. Tie him up and give him a sponge bath. And she goes, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, that's what I did. I kept seeing my dad's face. And so I tied my lover down <laughs> and I gave him a sponge bath. And she's like, what? I said, boy, can't hurt me now, can he? And I said, and I'm the one in control. I says, I was actually afraid that I might hurt him. And uh, I said, so I was real careful because I was scared because I knew I had all this violence and anger inside of me. And I said, but it definitely worked. I said, it, it showed me that I was in control. I says, because sexually I was never in control. It was always, they're holding me down and I would fight. And so it was wrong to enjoy it. To see it as, basically, you know, I mean, sex can be an art form like anything else. You can really have a great time with it and really enjoy it. Both partners, please. <laughs> but when you've, got a, when you've got a background like that, it's really hard. And so I, I, I told many women to tie their partner down. I don't tell men that because they might get violent. And uh, one guy said, I don't want to do that because I'll hurt her. And I said, well, then don't do it, you know. But uh, she said it worked. And she says that every time she feels it start to come back. One of the things that, that I have to do every day to combat the self-hatred that you get from this kind of thing and the self-loathing is I always do nice, I say nice things to myself. Every day I say, I love you, Rebecca. I, I you know, you always dream of your soulmate. You know, I, I, you know, I just want to have someone to say I love you and be there for me and to nurture me and all this other stuff. And so many people don't have that. Especially when you have a lot of self-hatred, you sure don't have that. Because and even if you might have, you might not even recognize it as that. And you're going to tell them to get lost yeah. because what rotten taste you have to love this bitch, you know? And so I, I decided to become my own soulmate and to say the words of love and to nurture myself and to say the kind things that I needed to hear. Of course, I didn't believe it. Bullshit. Fucking liar. I mean, it's a good attempt. No, it's a good, it's a good, no, path. It's a good that's, way to start. That's the that's thing. You have to keep at it. Yeah. You, you, without believing it, it, it doesn't matter if you don't believe it, because you, you won't believe it, and you won't believe it for a long time. It took me six months before I felt the slightest difference, and the difference was when I was brushing my teeth, and I told you that story, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I never looked at my whole face in the mirror, ever, because I was so hated and so hideous. I'd put my hand over part of my face, and, you know, if I put makeup on, I'd put it on like this, and, you know, or I'd cover my lower face so that I could do my eyes. I was going to say, I, just so everyone knows, she's covering her face as she says this. Oh, yeah, that's this right. Is not, this my, is not a video. Put my, put my hand over my face. <laughs> they might actually hear it where she's like, and I cover my eyes. Right. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but um, I, after I was doing these self-love exercises, and also you have to refrain from self-depreciating humor. You know? You can't make fun of yourself. Be. Because that does, when you're, especially when you're an insecurity addict, what it does is two horrific damages. For one thing, you're being cruel to yourself. You're being a bully, and you're damaging yourself. But you're encouraging other people to join in. Come in here. The water's fine. Let's mm -hmm. have a shark feeding frenzy. And you're always waiting for somebody to stand up for you, and nobody ever does because you invite them to hurt you. You set the example. You set the precedent. Right. Like I used to say jokes like I said, um, uh, 
I just wish I had zippers all over my ass so I could just stick the food in there and bypass digestion because it's going to be a lumpy mess anyway. Ha ha ha, everybody would laugh. That's an awful thing to say about yourself. But everybody would laugh and then Not people would make sure jokes about it. Not even quite sure how that would work. Like if, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know if it would digest that way. I don't... And oh, I just we, let it we rot should, in We there. should mention that Rebecca has teeth in her anus. So. That's right. <laughs> well, have you seen this, this rape tool? Uh, yes. With oh, teeth? Yeah, actually, yeah. yes. Yeah, actually, you, you posted that yesterday on Facebook. And did you I see how the it. doctor who designed it, what gave her the idea? She was talking to a young rape victim, and the rape victim said, I just, I really wish I'd had teeth down there. And so you insert this thing, and it's soft. It's like a diaphragm. Yeah. But a guy sticks his dick in, and it ain't coming yeah. out with that thing oh. hooked on. And I'm like, I bet that would just erase the rape epidemic in, in Africa right Real away. Real quick. <laughs> but it would, at, the, at the same time, it, would, it wouldn't really help in Africa where AIDS is at like its highest. That someone's now sticking themselves in there, and it's immediately causing like a bloodbath. You know, although yeah. it is. Oh, I'd rather take that chance. But it might not. <laughs> but you know, people people might learn the lesson after the. You know. Well, just saying. Yeah, I mean, Johnny I think... came back. He's got no dick. You know what I mean? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, right. You almost think. Like, this is he's terrible got to that say. Hellraiser dick. But like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like someone getting maybe kidnapped and about to be raped might, might just be like, really, really, guy, go, go for right it. ahead. Go Here for you go. It. Come go on in. <laughs> Please do. That might just scare him to be like. Mm, no, you're there too into this. I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> there might be something going it's, it's on. It's like here. they had that uh, that South African um, thing that you could install on cars because carjackings were at like an all time high there, and uh, it was basically a flamethrower that would, <laughs> it would like so someone would yep. come to your driver's side yep. door and you'd just be like anyway, and they would get hit with a flamethrower and there was no instances of anyone having to use that. I don't know if it's just that obvious that you have it or what, but I can only imagine, like, you know, going from being horrified of carjacking and be like, so, who wants to carjack? <laughs> That's right. Take my car. I would love if, like, you know how we have, like, Viper security alarms? If, like, whoever invented that called it, like, yeah, dragon breath or something like that. <laughs> right. And, like, you just see the sticker on the car protected by dragon breath. You're like, yeah, I'm not touching I'm not that. Touching <laughs> that. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid and they had those Viper commercials where, like, the CG'd Viper the would, come would come out. Right. I actually thought, as a kid, that that was how that worked, that maybe, like, there was a Viper that kind of hung out in your wheel well and was trained so well in attack. You know, because people who are robbing your car, obviously, they're wearing ski masks. So, like, it recognizes the ski oh, masks. No, right away. It's like, uh... it's like, I never thought that these cold-blooded animals, like, the alarm wouldn't work in December in New York, but... <laughs> Well, well, then again, if they're by the engine, I might keep them warm enough. Yeah, maybe, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll stay up. Remember when I told you the thing about when I was a little tiny kid and I saw the, the news program my dad was watching and the news announcer said that a local woman had been raped? And they actually used the word rape, which they were not allowed to use before. And my dad was scandalized and he actually called my mom out from the kitchen to actually say the word rape. And she's like, oh, that's disgusting, that's smut, we don't need to listen to that. And I was tiny. I must have been four or five years old. I remember, I go, what, what, what's, what's rape? And mom goes, you see, look at that, that's just disgusting. So, of course, it became, you know, my lot in life to find out what the word was. Nobody would tell me. And finally, my little friend that I played with, she goes, you don't know what that word means? And I said, no. So she took me in the bathroom, and she locked the door, and she pulled the shades. And she goes, rape is when a man grabs a woman, and he rips off her blouse, and he pulls off her brassiere, and he sticks pins in her boobs. And I go, what? And she goes, yeah. And I go, oh, and I started crying. I'm like, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. And so I go home, and my dad's National Geographic, new National Geographic is on the table, so I'm excited. I open it up, and it shows these African topless women, and they have the flat boobs like this. And I used to think that, that breasts were full of air. Mm -hmm. And so I started crying because I thought they had been raped, and it had all leaked out. And so I was sitting there <laughs> crying over the National Geographic. So I went to go sit by mom, and mom's sewing, right? And she's got one of those sewing tomatoes, and she kept jabbing pins in that sewing tomato. And I started screaming, and I ran out of the room. And at that moment, <laughs> you were like, what could be more horrific than this? <laughs> really, though, that's the worst. <laughs> Jeez. Well, speaking of all the crazy stuff that's happening in Africa, um, some of it's come back here. <laughs> yeah. They have confirmed case in Dallas. Um, which, 
I don't know. It just seems stupid to bring anybody back from there anyway. Well, you have to think, though. This is, this is a place where in some of these areas people are getting sick and doctors are giving them treatments that aren't treatments. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're you know, it, it's believed in some of those areas that you could rape someone to get rid of your AIDS. You know, right. like, so if, if someone I knew were over there and they had Ebola... I would totally want them to be back home and be treated here, you know? So I feel, I feel like that's where the line is. Is like, imagine that your, your girlfriend was over there doing, you know, helping out or whatever, and then she got Ebola. Well, the and then problem, you were going to find out that she was going to get treated in one of those hospitals where would, it's easier to get Ebola than get rid of it. Yeah, but they can send, I mean, we, they just can send the aid in a different way. It's like they could, they could uh, construct something that would be protected, whether it's by army or whatever it is, um, so you don't have to worry about those outside threats. And well, the problem obviously there this. are doctors that have volunteered to go there. So find another one that have volunteered to go there and treat them. Well, the problem with this is is he didn't know. And then when he went to the doctors, he went to the hospital, and they just gave him antibiotics. They didn't know he had Ebola. And he had, and so God knows how many staff who were taking cultures and all this oh, other yeah. kind of stuff, you know, got infected and everything. The problem with, I mean, I'm, I'm all for them bringing it back as long as it's controlled, but it wasn't that's controlled. That's the problem. He comes over on the plane. It wasn't he like... doesn't even know he's infected. And that's why the CDC, you know, said, oh, no one on the plane was infected because, you know, you're, it's only contagious when symptoms start to show and his symptoms weren't showing. Well, his symptoms started showing a day later. So that's bullshit because you start, you know, you start sweating it. Um, before you start, you know, showing the real bad fever. And as we all know, this guy loved to cuddle. So he just found a, a buddy on the plane. He was cuddling with them. Well, that's the that's the them. that's the only safe thing about Ebola is that right now it's only by fluids. Yeah, and that it is as, not airborne. But well, you Ebola could sneeze, as like, well. Well, no, the also... problem the problem with Ebola is Ebola. Um, I read the Hot Zone. I don't know if you read that years ago when the very first cases of Ebola came out and what the I just early heard about 80s, that book a few days ago. Actually. Most terrifying book you will ever read. It's terrifying, and um, it says that Ebola does to you in two weeks what AIDS does to you in twenty years. And that's a big thing about Ebola is that. You know, with AIDS, you don't know for a very long period of time, or, you, you know, you could not know for a very long period of time, and you could go out and give more people it. Whereas with Ebola, you get pretty quickly, you know, encumbered with that disease. And so that's why I'm not as afraid as a lot of people about Ebola becoming, like, a big thing, is because you really do, like, get it and sort of kind of fall into it, as opposed to, like, you know, getting rabies and wanting to go out and, you know go to people, you know, you kind of fall into it and you're, like, you become encumbered with it. I mean, your body breaks out into, like, pustules and boils. I think well, what the most scares dangerous... people the most about it, though, is the movie rather outbreak. than AIDS, well, <laughs> which was, could have been a better movie, because it was good, but there was too much, like, comedic relief, I think, for, for that subject, but I, like, I enjoyed it. I thought Dustin Hoffman was awesome. But anyway, um, what I was going to say is that the way that it can transmit, like, you don't have to fuck someone without a condom, you know, you know? It could just be somebody that was... Well, uh, sneeze out, whatever, whether something like wipe their nose because they're just getting the symptoms and not realizing yet, um, wipe their nose or something, and open a door. And then... Well, they can touch you like you, this and you get it. Yeah, like whatever it is. Your skin. Well, the problem with Ebola also is the fact that it doesn't die outside of its host. You can dig up a body that died of Ebola 10 years ago and the Ebola's still active. Whereas, I mean, AIDS lives, what, two minutes outside of its host? But if you have, even. if you have, yeah, it's really short-lived yeah, yeah. outside of its, its host. Like, but yeah. Ebola, it's like, I didn't give a shit. And, um... Uh, Ebola, don't give a fuck. <laughs> I know, don't give a fuck. <laughs> but the problem with it is, is I know that, uh, uh, I know a, a friend who researches all this, and he said that, he said Ebola has a ability to mutate quite quickly. And he says if it goes airborne, forget it. Uh, if yeah. it's airborne, forget it. But uh, the problem with this guy who came over who was turned away from the hospital and then came back to the hospital is, um, you know, who all touched him. Exactly. Because it's, it's not body fluids like semen or just blood. It's, it's spit, it's, it's sweat. tears, it's sweat, it's everything. Has got and, and they're in fucking it. Dallas. People sweat a lot in Dallas, man. It's hot right. in there. Like that. <laughs> like yeah, well, happen. it all depends on where he went and how many, like, they, they've already got just about everybody who's been near him in isolation 
and they have to watch them for 21 days. But and it's there's like, one person they're pretty sure has got it. It's the, like a six degrees 80, of separation thing right where... Now, they have, like... Oh, they have 80 now. Yeah, or okay. up to 100. Apparently, he threw up outside the building, too, like, before oh, on his way that. to the hospital. Oh, I just that's not good. saw it today. Um, I mean, it was some link from some news article. I didn't see which one, so, I mean, it could be bullshit. Um, but that's... Well, no, the what thing I'm most so scared about is, is, you know, crazy bioterrorism. Somebody getting, you know, a viable sample of it and just throwing it all over the place. Or somebody yeah. being infected with it and purposely going and, you know... Just pulling, like, a medieval warfare and just dropping exactly. infected corpses and... Exactly. Well, remember 12 around. Monkeys? Remember yeah. Remember the crazy guy in 12 Monkeys? You know Monkeys? what, though? I was... They would do it I like that. I was young when I saw it, so I didn't understand it as much. Like, I, I didn't go back to see it. I just thought it was, like, really weird right. and I wasn't really following mm. it. Mm. I do have to go back and watch that one. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Well, they, they spread it. Um, they're able to... Because it's a time travel movie. Yeah. And, they and you know, the whole human race is wiped out. And they all live underground, the only survivors. And none of them are immune to it. It's like they just survive just because they're underground. And um, so they send this guy back. And they were able to trace it from... I think like the, what was it, the Philly airport or something, some airport in America, big airport, and then they traced it to all these different countries, so they know that somebody brought it like that. So they think it's the army of the trailed monkeys who are these bioterrorists, you know, domestic bioterrorists, and uh, and in the end, you see them at the airport, and you see a woman flipping through all these tickets this guy has, and she names every single country where it, it starts at. Where it first appeared at, and it's a and it's a weaponized disease that had like a ninety something percent. And going back to monkeys and uh, and spreading diseases, oh. um, is uh, did did we all see the uh, Planet of the Apes remake? I yeah. did. And the first I, one, not the second one. Yeah, I I haven't seen the second one yeah, yet. Yeah, I like the at, second one too. Spoiler alert: at the end of it, uh, the it becomes like the simian flu starts getting spread. I think they call it, and it shows that little timeline af- like after the credits start yeah, of with the that mat. guy who by the way his life must have been really sucking up till then he got his finger bit off by a chimp <laughs> he gets his car destroyed so he had to take the cab so now the cab driver's got whatever disease that same guy runs into uh <laughs> the the fat roommate who's in Broad City and he sneezes on him and he you know now right. he has the disease and he spreads it through the airport and they show that little line and how it spreads how it and continues across the global map. how it somehow completely avoids the southern hemisphere if you actually watch that part <laughs> but um, yeah and it's interesting to see that things like that can happen I mean there's there's an entire game Plague Inc on the on you know iOS or I think you could also play it on the computer. That's just based off of being a disease and figuring out how to make yourself spread <laughs> how to mutate, well. how to get um, into other people. What I should add, though, is that as of 57 minutes ago, when we were recording this at 3.33... Oh, yeah, um, we didn't go over what date it was or anything. It's yeah. October. <laughs> is it the first or second? Second. I don't even know. Second. It's October um, 2nd, 2014. As of 57 minutes ago, the UN is... Uh, is making its highest priority stopping the global spread of Ebola. So good, but it seems like if that was the highest priority, you wouldn't bring people back. Uh, like they didn't know. But this is fifty-seven minutes ago. But no, there are people they brought back that they did know. Like this one guy. Well, or no, they it was. had them. Did you see when they brought him off the plane? Those two doctors. I they were in one of those. It looked like an iron lung, a big old plastic iron lung. Yeah. They had him in there, completely isolated and double sealed it's, and everything. You know what? Though, like, they <laughs> might be able to use them because they're both recovered. The well, thing I'm scared about is they they did that. Actually, that, yeah, they yeah. I heard actually that they used some type of experimental experimental uh, uh, Ebola vaccine yeah. or not vaccine, but you well, know, treatment treatment and and they said that it works. So of course the pharmaceutical companies are going to. It's pretty really weird it because just turns people into especially zombies. talking about outbreak, like that's exactly what happened. They had some secret thing that they knew kind of worked and. Well, that's yeah, they, it's like V they for used. Vendetta. Remember V for Vendetta? You know what? I didn't see it... that all the way through. Oh, and I, God, if, no. yeah, I should be punished for that. No, yeah. honestly, 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 I will, I will stand on the side of I, I enjoyed watching that movie, but a lot of people have made it to be like the world's greatest movie. Yeah, and I personally didn't did not see that in the movie, and also like knowing the whole history of Guy Fox and how that relates to our time and terrorism. Um, it's just, it's all very interesting that, like, everyone was horrified of this guy, that he was going to, like, blow up things, and we've sort of somehow made him into, like, this revolutionary, and it it almost makes me think of, like, in the year 3000, like, 
people start wearing, like, you know, like, Osama masks, and they're like, yeah, we're talking about being revolutionaries, and, like, well, you know, like, almost like the, the praising of Che Guevara. It's yeah, like, exactly. really, exactly. you praise him? <laughs> yeah, he's a revolutionary. I mean, oh, I yeah, what did he do? I know he looks cool in a t-shirt, but yeah. you actually know what this guy does? It's like when people wear Charles Manson t-shirts. Yeah. I remember my, my brother, uh, Ian, the one who was killed, he, uh, in, in uh, Kmart, he was, oh, like, 18 years old. No, no, he was 19 because it was right before he was killed. He uh, sees this great big giant biker dude wearing a, a SS, a Nazi SS, uh, uh, not helmet, but just the hat, you know, the uniform hat. And uh, he went over there and he just knocked it off the guy's head. <laughs> and my mom was with him and she was just terrified he was going to be killed by this giant guy. And my brother goes, what the fuck is the matter with you? Do you know how many people, because remember, this is in the early 70s. And so World War II is not that far away. Yeah. And he goes, he says, you know how many people fucking died to get rid of that and you're wearing it here? What the fuck is the matter with you? And the guy started crying and apologized. He's like, I didn't know, man. My name's I Stephen Smith. It, I, I know. thought it was perfect. I just thought it was cool, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so many things that people wear, like those those Nazi-style helmets, the the Iron Cross, which are like things that were previously symbols that, like, the Nazis used and, like, wore Well, they're all pride. occult symbols, yeah. And, yeah, and it's so interesting that people, like, you know, the swastika, which was originally meant peace and now right. it represents mm-hmm. the Nazis... World peace. ...is something that has, like, you know, taken that blow, but a lot of the other things the Nazis wore and did, did not. I mean, the outside of, you know, uh, you know tribes that you know use skulls and you know like the sugar skull which is becoming big throughout mexico the popularization of wearing a skull kind of came from the nazis and have you ever seen the uh there's a funny uh sketch i don't know the name of the they're two english comedians and they have this sketch where they're basically like uh, it, the the name of it is like are we the baddies because they're wearing like skulls on everything and like <laughs> at no moment could you not have realized like maybe we're the bad guys you know like and it's it's so funny to think that like world war ii was just this time that completely changed so many things and that includes fashion and the use of the skull and like the use of Hugo Boss clothing, which is right. the, the Nazi uniforms were designed by Hugo Boss. Well, and, uh, and and words, even words, you know, blitz it means to hurry up. And um, balls to the wall means right. to put your your mm-hmm. throttle right. to the wall all the way forward. Right. <laughs> it does not actually mean your testicles. Water cooler, you know, talking around the water cooler, that's a that's a marine term. Huh. I, I didn't yeah. know that one. Yeah. What um, always interests me is like. You said in the seventies that wasn't far away. Like even th- now, that wasn't that far even away now in, it's in bad. human history. And it's good. Like it's very recent, and that type of stuff. You you think about it as ancient history. Like if you grew up in the eighties or nineties or whatever, you're like, oh, that was like so long ago. But really, you could theoretically know people that lived through that still. You know? Yeah. So it's like, damn, well, that's not. We're not that far removed from that stuff, and even like. Everybody's like against big corporations now and this and that. Like IBM sold the Germans right. the stuff that they used to like keep track of the Jews in the concentration camps. Right. Like the early like computer models are like the tabs that they kept. Um, well, and NASA kind of like a punch card type of thing. Like they freely sold that shit to them. Well, yeah, and NASA we never would have got to the moon the way that we did. We had not scientists, Nazi, scientists Nazi scientists who were. Putting Jews in vacuum changers, chambers and seeing how long it kill, it took to kill them and things like that. Well, and heat and cold. And a big thing about the um, World War II that a lot of people don't talk about is the um, amount of medical advancements that came from right. experimenting on real captive humans. And it was a horrible thing that happened. I'm in no way condoning it, but... There's so much stuff that we would have never learned if they hadn't gone, you know, let's try sticking this in this guy well, and seeing well, what happens. I don't know if no, it's that you would have even, never learned even, it, because you could have probably went about it in a different way and learned it. Way. Like, you can get people that maybe, volunteer. whatever, volunteer if they have a certain, you know, disease or disorder or whatever it right. is. Or, like, there are different ways to go about it than be like, well, well it's not kidnap, just, well, yeah. it's not kidnap just, this race of people. There was definitely, like, a huge, I mean, you got to figure, in order to get something approved as a real study you have to have a good a good sample amount yeah and once again i want to reiterate i'm not saying that what the nazis did was great but i I am saying that you know in order to get a large sample amount how many people are really going to 
volunteer for something that you're not proven. So exactly. well, obviously, it was horrible what they did. I mean, they they operated on people with no anesthesia, and they also tested out different types of anesthesia that we use today. But you know, it's just insane to see like what they did and what we actually kind of got from it. Unfortunately, well, it's not There's just the good Nazis. stuff that comes out of everything. Yeah, you know? like. Um, what good can you get out of this pile of shit? I can grow flowers in it. Yeah, and maybe right? mushrooms. <laughs> and mushrooms, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's like um, it's not. It wasn't just the Nazis who were doing experimenting because I read this really great book on uh, surgical procedures and experiments in in the Pacific in World War Two. And uh, these doctors were like, "Oh my God, everybody's dropping over from malaria and all this other shit, and they don't know what to do." They're giving them the Adabrain, which made their ears ring and their skin turn bright yellow. Charlie. Um, my uh, stepdad was a Marine in World War II, and he used to, he said, we used to spit our Atabrain tablets in a, a bucket to dye the water so we could dye our white T-shirts. He says, they give us all this camouflage, and then they give us white T-shirts. <laughs> he goes, which is a perfect little target yeah. for anybody at night to see, he says, because it just shows up. He says, so they'd spit their yellow Atabrain tablets into the bucket, and they'd dye their T-shirts <sighs> with it. But nobody would take the Atabrain because you got really nauseous, it made it made your ears ring. You got terrible headaches from it, and your your skin turned lemon yellow. And he says the whites of your eyes are bright, bright yellow. And he says, and it's just awful. And he said, so we wouldn't take it. And he goes, they actually had to start making us take it at gunpoint because it's to get rid of the malaria. But you know how the Japanese stopped their malaria outbreak? Everybody considered, you know, the emperor was a god. If the emperor requested that you do anything, you would do it, no matter how awful it was. And so one of the officers, Japanese officers, decided, uh, bigwigs, decided it was a good idea to print on the inside of each Atabrain tin, because it's like little pills in a little tin. It said, the emperor requests that you take two of these twice a day with meals. Now, did and they the actually have the approval to do that? They just do it and they be just like, did hey, it. let's, uh, oh, this will work, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, they just did it. Yeah, because the emperor requests that you do it. And so it's just fascinating, the whole psychological thing of, of humanity, you know, if there's somebody who's revered or something like that, regardless of whether they deserve it or not, it, people will obey. And people want to be part of a crowd. It's like that test they did yeah. of um, where they... talked about being on teams last, uh, last episode. Like, just everybody wants yeah. to be part of... Their bipartisan from even some, team. <laughs> yeah, whether it's politics or, like, when, like, Team iPhone or Team Galaxy, like, right. everything will be a part. Well, and, there was, there was um, this test I just saw on Facebook where um, it was an actual psych test and they were they didn't tell the guy what it was for they just basically said it was like some sort of a, a visual test or whatever and they had three actors and then this test subject and he didn't know the other three were actors and so they would have an, you know, a ABC answer it's either A, B, or C and they're obvious questions like this picture looks like this which, which two pictures are the same and it shows like you know, two cylinders that are the same length and one is really long. And so they're like, you know, A and C are the same. So he got the first one right. Everybody else guessed wrong on purpose. And as it progressed, they always guessed wrong. And so they wanted to see how long it would take for the guy to actually guess wrong just to be part of the crowd. <laughs> and a huge percentage of them did that. Yes, they would eventually guess wrong just to be part of the crowd. And they were doing a study to see how the Nazis enthralled an entire nation. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to... Uh, and I have a, a point I'll go back to later, but um, it's interesting to see like that all the people that were Nazis, like a lot of them felt justified in what they were doing. They thought they were helping their country. And a lot of it was just this sort of yes and like mentality. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if you... Um, you know... Uh, in Inglorious Bastards, uh, the uh, Jew hunter played by Christoph Waltz, um, he's actually, what is he, he's Austrian, right? And um, he said that the way to, he only would play villains that he could relate to why they're doing that. And he said that, you know, the people at that time felt so justified in what they were doing that he understood the way that these, like, that these villains could be created. And so... Like that's and that's a big part of his character is you know you can't tell if he's really being like snarky and aggressive or if he's actually just being like a kind of nice guy who wants you to put some cream on your pie because the cream is fucking great you know but like you almost feel like this whole time he's got this long con that he's playing that he's trying to like you know get you to like 
tell him everything, but in all reality, he was a guy who was doing his job, thought he was supposed to be doing that job, Mm -hmm. and felt completely okay with doing it. So, you know, he wanted to, you know, he wanted you to try this pie, and this pie is really great, you know? (laughs) like so something, it was like, uh, I think it's a girl that's like still in high school, that maybe it was college, I don't don't remember the details of it, but I guess she did a presentation or essay or something on how Darwinism and the theory of evolution is what brought rise and allowed like the pretty much the Holocaust to happen and stuff. Well, and so a big thing. It's funny because we blame like we're, during World War Two, we blame you know eugenics on the Nazis, but in all reality, eugenics was like this huge thing that like Darwin said survival of the fittest, and everyone misheard that and was like, well, they're superior races, obviously, and we need to get rid of those, and like eugenics was like very close to becoming like a law where you could like declare people unable to reproduce and there's still people today who think that but well they did it in this country yeah and what it comes and what it comes down to is like you know even if i think because sometimes i'll even think to myself like wow that is a person that should not reproduce (laughs) but you know in all reality i encounter a few of those people yeah almost daily yeah exactly (laughs) and when it comes down to it it's like who are you to decide and that's what it ends up coming down to in the long run is who gets to decide and who what would they do to make that decision? In all reality, if our government passed that, the people who would decide would be our government. It would be, a, like, yeah. 90% rich white dudes, like, you know, making decisions of, but that they already do. They already oh, yeah, make decisions yeah, like about, about women's bodies. Kind of but, you know, they would be making these huge life-altering decisions about who could reproduce. And um, well, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off. But um, what I was going to say before is about, you know... During World War II, there were all these atrocities going on, and I believe it was shortly after World War II that we annexed um, Puerto Rico as a U- U.S. territory. I'm not sure exactly what year that was, and um, we were doing no, horrible it was before. things. It was before. It was supposed to be a state, and then they froze it, and then they just they never made it a state. And we were doing horrible things. We actually, the birth control that we use today was tested on Puerto Rican women. And, like, there's actually, as I was pulling this up to make sure that I didn't, like, you know, because when I originally learned this, it was from a, one of those stupid, uh, you know, monster hunters thing on the Chupacabra. And they were like, they were like, well, they (laughs) tested birth control, maybe it's some sort of malformed child or whatever. And I remember having looked it up afterwards, but I just made sure to look it up now, just to make sure I, you know, didn't misunderstand it. Evidently You're there not were spreading bullshit. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like I hate when people do that. People will hear something somewhere and they'll just that's, repeat it. And, and that's like, why I preface everything. If I don't remember everything, I'm like, listen, this is where it came yeah. from. It could be bullshit, but this is what I heard. Oh, Take it. I love Take posting it with your stuff on I like, love I have posting to that. Do that. But listen. evidently there were like because I looked this up and it says eight atrocities that we committed against Puerto Rico. So evidently there were seven other things that we did <laughs> other than just go, hey, this might make you infertile. This might help you get a regular menstrual cycle. Maybe this you'll might... grow a third boob. Yeah, yeah, we're not you sure. Know. Well, you know, I look at it at an um, uh, evolutionary uh, phase. You know, I'm, supposedly humanity is in its infancy on an evolutionary scale right now, and I would say, you know since history first began to get recorded, that we're basically in the terrible twos right now. Well, the the way thing, that we're they, brats. If you compared, the, the way I've heard it is like, if you compare the history of the world yeah. to the Empire State Building, the, the amount of time that people have been on the planet Correct. is the size of an ant. Like, right. so, I, I always do this. I agree with something before I hear what you had to say. So I was agreeing, <laughs> thinking that you were going to say, if you look at the entire history of the world, this is actually the most peaceful time. And it's right. scary to say because we live in it and we live in this media culture where we constantly hear about the things that are going on. And to someone who grew up saying, like, you know, you were saying they couldn't say rape on television. Right. You know, uh, the... Um, I can't remember his name, but the creator of the Dick Van Dyke show was talking about how, you know, he was doing the Comedy Central roast. He was so excited that he could say, like, shit. And I think <laughs> I think he, like, very excitedly went, cunt! And, like, was really excited about it. But, um, you know, he wasn't even allowed to say pregnant on on the Dick Van Dyke show. And so... Right, right. And so it's, it's really easy for people that grew up in that time to think that this time is so much more dangerous. But if you actually look at it, it's kind of come to a head, and this is the most peaceful time. Because if you really think about it, there, you can't, for the most part, you can't challenge someone to a duel anymore, you know? There's right, you so can many watch things. it on TV I feel yeah. like instead of go to the I gladiator feel like that's still pit. <laughs> a perspective thing. 
Because, like, people in Rwanda probably don't feel that way. Oh, yeah, no, you know, definitely. Like, I mean, maybe over as a whole and a percentage of the population, that is probably true. Maybe, I guess. I, dep- I don't know what they're measuring it with, what they're basing it on. Yeah, I think when they're, you're, they're when basing you're in it a, off of... When I you're think, in war, you're like, okay, now this just sucks. Yeah, I right. mean, yeah. Yeah, technically, we've been in war, f- uh, you could argue, since the 70s. Well, yeah, so, like, yeah, we've you know, been in so, war, but we're not there. Well, technically, well, I mean, you and me aren't, but there right, are, that's what obviously, I mean. people are. No, and that's why people think, well, you know, we are... and we. Well, that's why, if, they, if it was an actual study, I want to know statistically, what... Statistically, yeah. What it was on, measured uh, against. On the... And, but it was also on a percentage scale. I mean, more people are dying in war and by violence now than at any time in our history, but there's more people on the planet. Exactly. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the population percentage. of the planet has doubled in my lifetime. Two interesting things. That's incredible. That One I found out about a while ago, but one was real recently. I think it was on Vice, where they said, I want to say since the 70s. They either said since the 70s or in the last 70 years. It was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> 70 was in there. That the, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that the number of People has the population has doubled, but the amount of animals has been cut in half. Oh yeah, and that's I'm sure that's correct. I, I, that that's just ridiculous to think about. So then, when you think of like being less dangerous or less violent, again maybe from an animal animal's perspective, it's mm. the most dangerous. Yeah, you know, like but in all reality, I mean, I think that what they consider violent in that situation is just a blood for blood sort of thing, as opposed to like you know we're we're killing off. The reason that there's so little animals is because we kill them to eat them. You know? Well, and we're destroying well, their habitat. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That. Also, yeah, that's a, um, that's a big Because they also... Big that's a good point. There are, there are places where they brought back um, animals that were near extinction, not extinction, but were endangered. Um, I know, but zoos they, used to make them extinct, and now they're saving them. But they brought them back for, like, the, again, fucking everything happens in Africa. But these high-fence operations where they have brought back the numbers, but for hunting. And they're high ticket hunts and stuff, and it's helped the economy, but it, and it also helps bring these animal numbers up. Which, if it wasn't for people hunting them and paying to hunt them, probably would have been extinct by now. Yeah. You know? Did like, you see what's happened in Yellowstone since they reintroduced wolves? Oh, yeah, they're taking over. <laughs> well, no, they're saving Yellowstone. They're doing absolutely incredible stuff. They're, you know, the deer population just went insane because they didn't have any predators anymore. And deer are like rabbit, they just constantly reproduce. And the wolves are keeping them down. But they also, uh, um, they're just basically helping the entire environment of Yellowstone, including they're changing courses of rivers. But eventually, beavers are coming back because of this, and blah, and they're cha- putting up dams, and they're doing this, and that's making habitat for this, that's bringing animals back because there's actually water there now. And they just had this whole thing of just how bringing back one natural predator that was there before we wiped them out. Well, that's the and thing. Yellowstone it's the is balance that they're better. gonna have to find because wolves will fuck shit up. Like when yeah. their numbers get large enough, like we talk about World War II, World War Two, they were um, and maybe it was World War One. Who the fuck knows? But like, <laughs> but um, you know, there's I want to say it was Russians and Germany or some shit where they they stopped fighting because they were in an area where wolves were just fucking killing everybody, man, and they had to have a ceasefire. To be like, you know what? I don't know if we can fight here because the wolves were doing more damage wow. than the armies to, were to each other. Well, and you know, there was also something. Again, not sure in the years. I, I think seventy was in there. I don't think it was nineteen seventy though. So I think it was seventeen hundreds, <laughs> where where wolves killed like thirty or forty people in Paris, like in a city, because they were like. There was well, two thousand. Okay, so like yeah, there, there actually there were a bunch of periods of time, and that's why they think like werewolves are a thing because there were periods of time where like wolves would suddenly become ravenous, and whereas now we live in these societies where getting into the house isn't so easy. Um, back then, if the you know deer population started to dwindle, the wolves could go out into homes and get to people, or go into villages and get to people, and so yeah, there was like these because uh, I I was reading about it recently about like werewolves and like all these related they cryptids. They should have had um, dragon breath uh, <laughs> security <laughs> devices on their house and then they would have been fine. <laughs> now I want to I, I want to ask though you know the dragon's breath is like a type of missile right? No I didn't. Yeah I, think, yeah I think dragon's breath is a type of like serious I know they have hellfire missile. missiles. Yeah, yeah yeah they have tons of missiles that have all these cool freaking names. Uh, that's a have you seen the stuff they're doing with Sonic? Tip my hat to the guy who named that missile. Right, <laughs> right. what they're doing with Sonic technology with weapons? That's terrifying. Yeah, you can like, like you can pop people. You yeah. can just pop someone. Yeah. You can just liquefy them. And it's it's uh, um, 
You could lift things. All you have to do is basically find out what their note is. Or lift the, objects. The resonant frequency well, of and stuff. And they, no. they think that that's how that, that crazy little Belgian guy in, in Florida made that house. What's the name of that house? Where it's all stone and the door is four tons. Disclaimer, no one knows what the fuck she's talking about. <laughs> right. Right. Hold on. Where, where was it? Let's see, let's see if Google knows what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, he's in Florida. Or he, he's dead now. But no one Florida knows. Florida stone house? Think that'll get me anywhere? Uh, try that, yeah. And they also Coral think that Castle? that's a way that they could end up getting rid of it. diseases is finding the resonant frequency Correct. of the disease. And, and as long as it's not the same one as maybe your blood cells, they can destroy it and sort of, yeah, dismantle it like Well, you that. know, my ex studied um, RNA, which is, you know, how DNA replicates yeah. itself. And he, uh, he said all cancer is is a cell that doesn't know how to stop doing that. Yeah. yeah. And if they can figure out what triggers it, but, you know, the proteins refold in completely different ways, and so you can never figure out what implies it. They don't know what makes the DNA unravel so that it can replicate itself. If they could figure that out, they could tell a cancer cell to If I showed you out. a picture, we'd be able to be like, oh, that's it. Let me it. see. For yeah, everyone at home, so. he's just showing her really, like, it's the strangest porn I've ever seen. Yeah, it's stone porn. <laughs> it, uh, well, no, this is Gorgon the story. Porn. <laughs> so this is the story. This guy has, or had, because he's dead now, he had this house that was completely made out of giant stones, and he always said he knew how the pyramids were built and everybody's wrong. They didn't, and he said, he said, gravity is wrong. He said, it's all magnetism. <laughs> well, no, just think. Tesla same, this said this, the same That's thing. That's just such a funny line. Gravity yeah, is wrong. wrong. Just to say it like that. Well, this is why everybody thought he was crazy. You're I like, saw yeah, a documentary. you're on mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, I saw a documentary on this guy. And the door on the house is like four tons. And all the stones in the house are like multiple tons like this also. And he had an obelisk in his yard. And he got robbed when he was out on his walk or something like this, so he wanted to move. Do you know about when he might have made this? Um, it says the guy died in 1951. That's probably... This is for Coral Castle. This might be the one. Okay, well... It's the only thing that's coming up under Florida Stonehouse. The three-ton gate at the entrance. Yeah, okay, so that's probably it. But he would open the door. It didn't have any hinges. He would just open the door and go in and out, and nobody knew how he did it. Nobody could open the door themselves. And he also had electricity, and he wasn't hooked up to anything. He didn't have a generator. He didn't have anything like this, but the house was always lit up. And nobody knew how he did it. Now, one of the most interesting stories I heard was when he wanted to move, he had to hire a, a semi-truck to carry his obelisk because he had this giant obelisk. And so the guy comes, and he goes, okay, I don't know who this little guy is. And he goes, but there's no crane, there's no workers, there's no ropes. It's still up. And the guy's like, um, I need you to go behind the house because I don't ever let anybody see how I move this. And the guy's, whatever, buddy, you know, you're paying me. So he goes behind the house and he's smoking a cigarette. And all of a sudden he hears this, <laughs> this crash. And he runs and the obelisk is on his truck. There's no ropes, there's no nothing. And the guy's going like this. And he's like, what the hell just happened? So they drive it down to where the guy's going to put it up. And the guy goes, okay, can you go behind the new house? And he's like, okay. This time he's going to watch, of course. And he says he's actually peeking around the corner. And the guy goes, I know you're watching. <laughs> and he says he always knew he was watching. And he says, finally, he doesn't watch. And he goes, not five minutes later, I heard this noise. The guy goes, okay, you can come out. And he says, the obelisk was up. This yeah. was actually the first X-Men comic. Exactly. <laughs> and it sounds like an it was X-Files. Magneto, actually. It sounds like an X-Files. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah, they are saying through electromagnetism is the method. Yeah, he said he said it, he said he would figure out the magnetism. He says you can lift anything as long as you know it's magnetism. You simply flip it. And they're like, well, how did you do that? And he would never tell hmm. because he was real paranoid and he didn't like people. But um, he died with his secrets. And they found this weird... It looked like some sort of centrifugal something that was apparently some kind of generator that did his electricity, hmm. and they still have no idea what it is. It's it's uh, apparently this house is actually on ancient aliens. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> that's that's funny because the first thing I thought when he was like, D you know, don't look, like I see you're looking, is like this guy's a fucking alien. Like for right, right. <laughs> he's gonna be an, yeah, an alien. Story. Well, no, you probably just figured. Obviously, someone's gonna, they're gonna be looking. Of course it's they're just gonna be curiosity. looking. They're gonna, you, yeah, no like one's the, gonna just gonna be like, the, okay, the, the, the go behind this house again. Or he's got cameras up. Yeah, or like yeah. The, the people the, can't see. The first time the guy went around the house and he stood there going, stop looking, stop looking. 
And he, like, waited. He's like, all right, I don't hear him. <laughs> like, you know, like, he was just making sure, like, if you just say stop like, looking, you it's know It's like that. when you play hide and go seek with a kid, and you're, and you're like, no, you have to close your eyes when you're counting. <laughs> you like, know right. you know they're fucking looking. Um, it's interesting, because you brought up the pyramids, and, you know, they think that that's, that might have been how the pyramids were built. And there's so many different, you know, stories. There was that one guy who had that, like, fulcrum system about, like, where he could just put something right, on, right. like, a pebble and, like, pivot it. Um, it's interesting, because uh, for the longest time, we thought the pyramid was built by slaves and it's funny because there was like literally no evidence that said that and um and apparently at that time it would have been like 20 percent of the world's population they would have had to use to actually <laughs> um, accomplish that what's interesting is they're saying now it was just like a work program during the dry season that the that the pharaoh ran and that the pharaoh basically because Everybody would work throughout, I guess it was the wet season, and then the dry season, they'd have nothing to do. And so he set up this work program, and he would give people, you know, food and water, and they would build these things, and, like, everyone as a society did it. And, like, there was no, like, like, I mean, it, it wasn't so much that you had a choice, because you probably wouldn't have been able to harvest throughout the dry season, but it gave everyone, like sustenance throughout this season in which they would have died that the pharaoh had been hoarding all these things and holding on to them for this like for this season in which people would build the pyramids well does anybody know if zari hawass is still in charge of uh egyptian antiquities in egypt ever since the you know the arab spring yeah i don't He's, really know oh my god the guy has done so much damage to archaeology it just makes my Blood Apparently they're like bulb. refacing the Sphinx and stuff. Oof. Oh god! Like, oh god! I mean, like from everywhere, the parts to everything. Like they're like putting it's like putting a vinyl siding on <sighs> and shit. That's oh god! Fucking well, retarded. Zari Hawass has stopped so much research in Egypt; it's unspeakable. This team, this uh, team of, I think Americans and Brits got together, and they were shooting those little sonogram things into the ground. How they find dinosaurs now? They don't even have to dig anymore. They just shoot one of these things yeah. in the ground, and it does the pulse. They did it between. Uh, the Sphinx's pause because Edgar Casey and Nostradamus or whatever made some mention that there's a chamber between the paws. And they found a chamber. There's actually a chamber down there and it's big enough there's stuff in it. So they started to dig it out. Because they had their permits and everything. All of a sudden, Zai Hawass sends his troops in and they kick him out of the country at gunpoint. They just throw everything back in and they reburied it. And, and Zai Hawass has publicly, vehemently said... You know, no, civilization began with Egypt, with, with Egyptians. And there, there's all sorts of studies that now say that there might have been some culture that predates Egyptian history. And he doesn't want that to come out. It's like that one woman who did the research and they think she found Nefertiti. And she did it because Zai Hawash just thought she was this stupid red-haired, you know, British woman. Isn't she cute? Let her do her research. And she batted her eyes and she pretended to be dumb. And she basically proved that this mummy that they found was Nefertiti. It was incredible. But the worst one is the Yupuat, which was a little tiny robot. You know how in the Great Pyramid there are those, those um, eight-inch in diameter shafts that go way the hell up there, hundreds and hundreds of feet? I think it's, and nobody, more, than, I think it's more than that. They're just that. gigantic, right? They just, uh, uh, and most of them go all the way to the outside. So they're just impossibly huge, and they twist and, and they turn. And some just have dead ends. And... and nobody knows, well, they're not dead ends. They have a limestone block that has been dropped down, and they have a little tiny triangle cut out of the corner. And the Yupuat, this little tiny robot with these tracks, because, you know, some of it is so steep, nothing can get up there. You know, people used to screw poles together and stick it up there, and... The Yupuat, actually, in the documentary, I saw crawls past one of the poles that got stuck up there. And it gets all the way to the end of one, and it shines its laser beam down through that little triangle hole, and it did not bounce back, which means there's a chamber in there. Hmm. The second they Could did that... Could just be a, a dead fall for the people that, right. that move that out of the way. Well, and go, this, oh. Yeah, the second they did that, Zaya Was kicks him out of the country. They, um, talking about that, like there's a hypothesis going on now that there's evidence that it's water erosion on the Sphinx. Oh, yeah. So that they think... And the it, head's not, because Ramses recovered. They had redone the... Yeah, they had redone it. Mm -hmm. um, they think it was a lion. A lion, yeah, exactly. Because at the, the age of the body, it would have been looking straight at the constellation of Leo. And that... Um, so they got... They think that's water erosion, mm -hmm. which would make the Sphinx way Much older than older. they think, like by 5,000 years or something like right. that. And it's funny that you mentioned this dude, because when I wanted to get this information right, because I know I've heard of it, 
Um, apparently, they asked uh, Zahi, whatever, Hawass. Hawass, um, if like if there's any possibility of that. Could it could it be that old? Uh. And his response is, of course, it's not possible for one reason. No single artifact or single inscription or pottery or anything has been found until now in any place that predate the Egyptian civilization of more than 5,000 years ago. And He's full so, of shit. Well, it's kind of stupid because it's like, well, this is what is left, was this big fucking sphinx. That's what's left. Like, why would pottery be left from 5,000 years and ago? And look I, how weird the sphinx's head looks. It's so much smaller in proportion to the rest of the body. And it's also younger. They're, they're able to date the stone. The stone on the head is younger because Ramses... One of, one of the things that made Ramses the Great so, so great was he would just go and he would just have them sand off other pharaohs' names on things and just carve his name all over everything. And what's, uh, what's interesting uh, as far as, you know, uh, Egyptian history is so much of the things that, you know, we know as these Egyptian landmarks were all sort of grave robbed. They were all completely, you right. know, all of the artifacts were taken out of there. And that's why, um, you know, King Tut's... Uh, tomb was such a big deal because in the age of black and white photography, we discovered that, and it was we were able to see like wow they had all this shit inside of these pyramids and we didn't know any of that because it was all getting stolen. Well, you know? Tut was and not so, in a pyramid. That's what's fascinating. Yeah, and so it's interesting to see the amount of stuff that we feel like we know completely, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, by the way, this was just... I mean, there's so much sand there. It was just covered in sand, and no one knew until they finally uncovered it. And so it's crazy to think that, like, the thing that makes you popular, like, it, Egypt as a country is popular in that, like, we keep uncovering things and finding new things. The fact that you would stop that is, like, one of the dumbest things <laughs> that you could do. Well, did you hear about the ships in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt? There's unknown wooden ships under the ground that was found, oh, God, back in, like, the 70s. They dug them up. They're big ships. Each one's the size of a football field, and they are unknown ships. No one has any idea what culture made these ships. And the Egyptian government kicked out the researchers and made them rebury them. They're still That's there. That's so weird. What the hell Why are they? Why the fuck? But you know what's fascinating? If you read Joseph Campbell, and all he did was he studied... Um, uh, mythology and fairy tales and all these cultures have you know who've never had contact with anybody through our knowledge have very similar stories they all have a flood story and one of the fascinating things of like all these different cultures that had no connection whatsoever they all said that after the flood and everything's destroyed these people came from the sea and they were white with red hair, and they had blue or green eyes. And every culture like says Ariel? this. Well, cause, cause, and, because... Was, exactly. Well, because and Vikings were crazy, and... <laughs> well, this is way predates Vikings. And, um, and they taught them, but they said they were white, like ghost white, like super, like albinos or but, something. But think about, I mean, think about the people of the time. People of the time were very brown. So someone ghost white could be just as light as you or Josh. Yeah, could be right. And, you know... When we translate that, we hear it as, you know, you know, white as paper. But, you know, something that white isn't even, isn't even natural. I mean, so they would, like, you know, the whitest thing they ever saw to us could be something that's still relatively, you know, peach in complexion. Well, they said that they, they would come after the flood in all these different cultures, and they would show them how to rebuild stuff, how to get water, how to do this, how to make fire, how to make shelter. And then they left. There's and also... a lot of people think that Alexander was like one of their gods or something like this because apparently Alexander had light eyes and uh, what blonde hair, which is really bizarre. And, um, and like, um, you know how like Egyptian gods will have blue eyes? And Joseph Campbell says maybe that's one of the reasons is because of this strange people. And they were, all of them said they came from the sea. And so my first thought with those weird ships in Egypt is like, could this possibly be this weird race that they're talking about that these ships came from? Because they were of completely unknown origin and they reburied them. Well, there's a period of time in history called the Axial Age in which like all like all of the like, you know, quote unquote primitive cultures suddenly started developing these ideas like around the same exact time, all at different parts of the world. 
and they don't really understand how that happened. And what's and the age called? The axial age. Axial. Okay. It's really it's basically it's they're the, going to rename it to the alien age. Yeah. And just assume <laughs> that aliens came down yeah, an and alien showed game. them all at once. <laughs> so there is like there is the belief that like you know there could have been this outside you know intervention that got that, but there's also the belief that like we all sort of got to this point and we were all sort of like there was nothing that could come. Like, that was the logical conclusion of what happened at that point. And that we had all, like, pretty much, for the most part, a lot of cultures, some rose directly into that, but some rose and then plateaued and then started doing that. And it's, like, it's not even, like, a, you know, it's not like it's 10 years or whatever. It's, like, I think it's a 200-year time period where, like, suddenly people were like, wow. hey, wait, we can do this. What's, and, like, everyone did what's that. What's interesting about that, it's the first time that I'm hearing that, but something that I heard recently was um, tests that they've done with, mice and rats and stuff, probably not rats, I guess it's just mice, but, um, if they, uh, trained, like, if they trained a mouse, like a mother mouse or whatever, um, to go through a maze a certain way, and they would see, like, oh, 80% of the time it got electrocuted because it did the wrong thing, and then eventually learned. Its offspring would learn faster. And then they'd also have it where, like, if this was being done in New York, like, mice in England would learn faster, too. Gen- like generations down. That's Rupert Shel. That's Rupert Sheldrake, yes. my favorite scientist. That's I think his theory of collective memory or something like this, and he started to come up with the idea because he was a bird watcher, and he's a, you know real anal scientist, and so he loves to go back. And bird watchers were all just super exact note takers. So he's reading about the blue tit, which was the name of this bird in England. I thought that's what happened in Avatar. <laughs> yeah, really, 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 and, and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and see, it is, it's, uh, it proves his theory. Uh, and, Case closed. And he read about this bird that some bird watcher was watching at his neighbor's house, and the bird would pull the little cap off the milk jug, you know, the bottles of milk they put on the back step, pull the little cap off and drink the cream. And then birds in the whole, you know, and only that species, the blue tit, would... <laughs> would would do this and then it spread throughout all of London and then it spread throughout all of England and then it went all throughout Europe wherever this bird is anywhere in the world, right? But the fascinating thing about this is the birds are not migratory. They live and die within like a five mile radius. So he's like Yeah, that's the well, thing. And, the, and, the, and the mice since, weren't like actual offspring right. either. And so all these all these um uh birds you know, all these bird watchers, you know, they read somebody said that, and so everybody starts watching these birds, and it actually radiated out from that central point, and then... It's 413. Okay, and um, it radiated out from this, like, central point, and so he's like, what if there's some sort of species memory where you actually digest memory? So they did the thing with mice, they did the thing with a planarian worm, you know, flatworms, they taught a planarian worm to run a simple maze. And then they kill it, and they chop it up, and they fed it to other planarian worms. Once they digested that worm, they could run the maze perfectly. So Rupert Sheldrake started doing all these experiments, trying to see if there's some sort of collective memory. Now he's doing all sorts of research on psychic stuff and things like this. But he did a really cool test where apparently the London Times crossword puzzle is the hardest crossword puzzle in the world and they're famous for it and everybody loves it because it's so damn hard to do. I should, I should ask Linda about that to see if she... <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> Don't even speak to her. But, um... Uh, so he asked the, the guy who did the crossword puzzle, can you give me copies of the crossword puzzle the night before? Can I cut you up and feed you to people? Exactly. <laughs> and he had, he had 50,000 volunteers. And he gave them all the puzzle to solve that night. And he did this because he liked crossword puzzles too. And he and his buddies would talk about crossword puzzles. And they'd always talk about how it was easy to do crossword puzzles at night instead of in the morning. That they like to wait at night to do it because it's just easier. Now that makes no sense physically because you're more tired, your brain's more tired. Why would it be easier at night than in the morning? So he thought maybe they're digesting that all these people during the day have done this puzzle. So he had these 50,000 volunteers do this puzzle the night before it came out in the Sunday edition. The, pa- the newspaper got more telegrams and phone calls and hate mail and rage over that crossword puzzle saying, how dare you make this crossword puzzle so easy? <sighs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. This crossword puzzle is famous for being difficult. How dare you not do this? 
And and so at his his findings are always very interesting, but they don't prove anything. Exactly. It's not that's, proof. That's what's crazy about it. That's what's also fascinating, though, because when you look at all these obscure stories, um, but when you, again, like just following breadcrumbs, it's like it makes sense that, I mean, you hear that, you hear what the, the times that you just talked about, and even people, you know, the theory of, I don't know, theory or whatever, how are you going to talk about it, but like just wavelengths and people being on the same wavelength. Right. Um, they, I know, I don't, it might have been even been the same guy where, um, you know, if like you're thinking about somebody and then they call you. Yes. And like a few moments before you thought about it. Like they've had experiments with that too, where they've like kind of, again, it's hard to say that they proved it, but the percentages are greater where like you can, again, through wavelengths or whatever they're using to describe it, you know, you can tell who's going to call you or whatever, whatever that feeling you get of somebody's, even to somebody's watching you. They've trained, um... Uh, military people to you you they say you can feel when you're in somebody's oh, yeah. sights yeah like you know it yeah at the same time Design. though there's there's lots of studies that will say and i i should point out that of this group i'm like the skeptic even though i'm talking <laughs> about some of the weirder things um you know they also say that you wouldn't be as likely to remember feeling like you were being watched or you know a situation where you think oh this person's about to call me and then that doesn't happen you would have no reason to actually remember that. So when you think, oh, I'm being watched, and then you look and you see, oh, Rebecca actually is watching me, you know, I'm more likely to remember that than if going, oh, I feel like I'm being watched, and then looking around and going, oh, nothing happened. Kind of like also when people say, like, events happen in their life, and like, oh, beforehand I got this bad feeling before I knew anything was going to happen. Sometimes you do just get bad feel- feelings and nothing happens. Well, you know what's fascinating about that is um, uh, I remember you know, my one friend who's, who's psychic, and she doesn't do it professionally, and she will just freak you out because she's right most of the time. So it's actually fascinating. That, and what's she weird read, about that is like, that's where I'm actually skeptic in. It's like, I believe this. No, 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 I'll no, get no. chances to rely on this other she stuff. She should and go then for that, the James Randi million dollars if she yeah. did. Well, no, she <laughs> says, she says, because I told her, I says, you really have a gift. And she goes, it's not a gift. If they could tell me what the fucking lottery numbers is, then it's a gift. She says, seeing this shit I see is not a gift. But anyway, um, my ex-husband, I was still married to him when I first met her. And I was telling him how amazing she is. And, of course, he's a scientist. He's completely skeptical. And he goes, okay, have her read me. And so she read him, and it freaked him out so bad that he started doing all this scientific research on psychic ability because she got all these hits, including dates and names, that just completely freaked him out. And he's, he's like, you told her this stuff. And I said, I didn't know this shit about you. <laughs> so one of the studies that he found, which was really interesting, was 99.9 whatever percent of people who say they're psychic are either just kind of empathic, they're reading you like that, they're reading physical cues, but there is like a small percentage of 1% that scientists cannot disprove. And so they study them. Now, one of the fascinating things about this is the primal area of the brain fires like crazy when these people are doing their thing. And so some theories are that it's some sort of survival instinct that we used to use all the time that we don't use anymore because like say a dog your dog always knows when you're coming home or a lot of times even like if you come at a different time your car yeah. is you're you know you're in a different car whatever the dog still knows you're coming i'm pretty smelly so, though my dog can smell <laughs> it from far away, away. it's pretty cool <laughs> but um one of the fascinating things about this friend of mine is they found a tumor in her brain and they're like well you got cancer but now they think she was born with it, and it's directly over the primal area of the brain. And it's one of those spider tumors that goes out like, you know, like little f- filaments like that. And so it's like, maybe that's why she could do it. I remember when she first told me she was psychic, I'm like, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> you are full of shit. And she goes, I know, I wouldn't believe me either. I don't do it professionally. I don't know why I can do it. I can just do it. She should, and I'm like, yeah, right. She and should so, really go for the uh, Amazing Randy million dollar uh, challenge. She says you know, that like they'll get the... mad at her if she does that kind of crap. And I'm like, who's they? And she goes, whoever the fuck is talking to me. <laughs> but so she goes, I wouldn't. I, she says, I, I, I wouldn't believe me either. She goes, give me, give me something to read, and I'll read it. And I'm like, no, no, that's okay. Get out. <laughs> and no, just I, leave. I was, I was like, get out, seriously. And she goes, just come on, just humor me. And I'm like, all right. And I looked around and I grabbed a rock off my bookshelf. There's nothing on it. It's about the size of a baseball. I just hand her this rock. And she's only known me about two weeks. She doesn't know anything about me. And uh, we're kind of acquaintances. Hadn't become friends yet. 
And she's holding the rock, and she goes, Ian, which is the name of my brother. And I jumped, and she goes, it was so, and it was weird because her eyes were going back and forth like she's reading something. So, of course, I'm studying all this. And she goes, it was so fast. It was so fast. It came from the left. He was looking to the right. He should have been looking to the left. He was so surprised. He was so surprised. And then she goes, Jeanette? And I'm just like this, just freaking out. And she goes, no. And then she said the real name of my brother's fiance. And she goes, she lived, but she's crippled. And she goes, he stayed. He stayed for, for you and her. And you saw him when you were a kid. And when I was crazy, I saw my brother all the time. So I just burst out crying because I'm completely freaked out. And now I'm like, really get out of my house. My brother Ian was riding his motorcycle with his fiance on the back. And um, I won't say her name. And uh, this hot rod kid hit him and killed him, going on a curve in a no-passing zone, passed a truck, somebody was coming, he zoomed in front of the truck and hit the motorcycle. Now, the motorcycle jerked sideways, so my brother flew headfirst into the side of the car, was killed instantly. His fiance flew out the other way and hit a barbed wire fence and was wrapped up in 40 uh. feet of it. And every bone in her broke, body was broken, et cetera, et cetera, and then she was crippled for life. She got his name. She got what happened to him. She got his fiance's name, how they died, that he was hit from the left, and it was that rock was the last present he gave me as a little kid. Hey. There was nothing on it. There was no marking. There was nothing. And after that, I was like, okay, now you got to tell me. Once I got used to it, because it scared me so bad, I'm like, just get out. Just literally get out of here. And, but then after that, I became fascinated, and, uh, and I was like, okay, that was a one-off. But then I got used to her just being able to do it. And it was really weird and really strange. But it came fascinating once you stopped getting scared of it. Because, you know, when you're skeptical about this kind of stuff, and then you see somebody do it, it's like, you know, a, a primate coming out of the woods and seeing the moon and freaking out. I, you know what? I almost would... I feel like, I guess it's something you might have to experience. And I think I'd have the opposite reaction, though. I'd be, like, happy. I'd be like, that's awesome. Now I know. Like, you might be for real. Right. Like, that is... Well, no, I was happy once I got used to it, but at first it scared yeah. the shit out of me because I was not expecting it. I, I did not believe her. I just thought she was a nut, or I thought she was one of these people who's like, oh, I have a feeling, you know, that kind of crap. She never do that. She would do weird things like she and I are over at her house watching a movie, and she goes, oh, all right. And she put the movie on pause, and she goes, just a second. And she goes in the other room, and she comes back, and she gives me a book bag from the bookstore, and she goes... I bought this book about four days ago. They told me to buy it for you. Here. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And that night I go home and I start reading the book. And we were watching an obscure movie that I had brought over. And in the first chapter on like the third page, they mentioned that movie. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And it was that kind of stuff. It wasn't like, I have a feeling. It would be specifics like yeah. that. Which, and when she read my ex-husband, it freaked him out. And he was a complete skeptic. It freaked him out so bad that he became absolutely obsessed with anything that she did. And uh, so it's, it's fascinating, but it's a very, very rare thing. And I, and I, th I think it makes sense that it might be a, simply a primal instinct that we don't use anymore. And some people still, they just, they just kind of have it. What, um, what always made me laugh is when you see like, people that do, do it professionally and be like, you know, psychic, tarot readings, future, being told, and then it's like, had a business sign under it. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like, well, shouldn't you have seen that one coming? Yeah. Well, like. that's why she wouldn't do that because she said, she says, I get sick when I do that. And it made me think of Edgar Casey, who's probably, other than Nostradamus, the most famous and far more legitimate um, psychic in history. And he's, he's American. And uh, she loved Edgar Casey. And she says, yeah, she says he was like me. If he would do, you know, too many readings in one day or he was doing readings for people to make money, he gets sick. And she would just be talking about money and maybe something's going to happen. She would, you know, get sick. And it was fascinating to watch because if you think about it, the human brain uses 25% of energy consumed a day. Just your brain. 25%. That's incredible. And if you have something that's firing like that, I wonder how much energy it would take. And, of course, it would drain you. Like, I would see her do readings after 9-11 and stuff. She would do a bunch of readings, and then she'd just have to go lay down. 
and we would write it down, and then I would phone it in from my house, and uh, and they found some of the stuff that she that she mentioned. That that is definitely something that's like amazing to me, though. Oh no, you know, it's I'm really and, and and maybe even more so because it's it's the one where you you can't put your finger on it. Like again, right. unless you unless it happened to you. Whether I mean, obviously, I believe you. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, I don't know you as somebody to make shit up. Right. You know, but it's still just. It's, it's like really you have to experience freaky. almost. Yeah. No, it's Weird. it's it's really strange to 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 see. Her. And she she told me she goes, you know, you're psychic, and I'm like, oh, I think I would know my psychic. She goes, no, you know, you're psychic. No, I don't know that I'm psychic. And she goes, everybody is. She says it's just a varying degree. She says it's like any muscle. If you exercise and, it, yeah, it'll get stronger. It's like those mental exercises you do to remember stuff for the SAT. She says it's exactly the same thing. You just do stuff that strengthens it. So, but it was really, it, it was really fascinating to be hanging out with her. Now Every we, day you just get used to this weirdness. Now that we probably have lost everyone who might have been listening to this. Right. <laughs> 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 but no, it's, uh, like I said, it is, uh, it's very, that part is very interesting to me, especially what we just talked about with wavelengths and that collective memory and even epigenetics, like, it's again one of those things that it's like you keep hearing stuff that is related and similar to it from different researchers researchers and from different periods of time and this and that where it accumulates and you're like there could be something pretty legitimate to all that because it happens in different places at different times with different people looking into it and and looking at it at from different perspectives in different ways and come to pretty similar conclusions yeah you know that you could at least relate to each other I love the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois, which they were just building when I lived there. And it's all about research in the human brain. And no matter how far-fetched it is, anything that, that supposedly has to do with the human brain, and then once a month, all the floor scientists get together and they talk about just what they've been working on to see if there's any correlations between these different things. Well, speaking of correlations, you know who did that, right? The Nazis, they did that. They would, yeah. any sort of phenomenon that, like, they saw a whole culture Well, so did in, FDR. They would go and they would research to see if that was a thing. That's why, like, the, the uh, you know, Indiana Jones movies star Nazis, because Nazis were actually doing that, going to these remote places and seeing, okay, this mysticism you believe in, is there a way we can use this? Is there a way that this is possibly true? And they pr- try to force it out of people, basically. And then if you saw the last one, it <laughs> ends up being aliens. So. <laughs> well, you there know, you um, um, the Nazis were really into Nostradamus. And they had all these, these things saying how the Nazis are going to win and Hitler's going to do this because he's actually named. And so the Allies got together and they said, okay, two can play at this game. And so they did all the quatrains that say that we defeat the Nazis. And, and they would drop those, you know, you know, by plane loads on people and stuff like this, saying, hang on, because Nostradamus says we're going to win. Well, the weirdest Nostradamus they, they thing... They actually, they dropped a lot of stuff, a lot of intentional misinformation on people. Everybody constantly. did. Oh, yeah. They would always be just, they would drop leaflets and say they were going to do something and then do it like the day before. Right. Or not even do it at all. Or, yeah, they were like, America was amazing with misinformation in World War II. Well, I love what Winston Churchill did that pissed off Hitler so bad with, you know, that one... Um, which cathedral is it that never got destroyed during the Blitz? I'm not sure. And there's all these famous pictures of its dome completely intact and everything around it is smoke. But that dome is perfect. And Hitler said he was going to give like this huge reward to whatever pilot could blow up that damn dome and nobody could do it. And so Winston Churchill would print up like 50,000 photos of that dome and drop it on Berlin. And then he would, like there was one real cool picture, I saw it where it shows this huge, huge Nazi... Um, a uh, bomb stuck in the middle of the road that did not go off, and this little old lady with a bucket of water pouring water on it. <laughs> and he printed up like 50,000 copies of that and dumped it on Berlin. And Hitler would have a fit and do one of his kicking fits when he saw these pictures. It was awesome. One of our uh, best American spies was, basically, he was rejected as an American spy, went to the Nazis, and was accepted as a spy for them. And then he went back to America and went, hey, I'm a spy for the Nazis, what you want to know? And he would basically, what his job was, was he would go out, he would stay out, and then basically he would get whatever information he could from the Nazis to relay to the Allies, and then he would come back like the day after there was an attack with information on the attack from yesterday. So his information was always like a few moments too late, so they wouldn't say like, oh, what you're saying is invalid. 
So he would always be coming back with information. So they kept giving him information and trusting him. And then like, yeah, oh, wow. like something big would happen. And he'd be like, hey, they said they're going to, oh, I guess they already did. You know? And like, <laughs> like, and he basically continued to like feed them misinformation and um, give them information like a day late on purpose. And, uh, yeah. To, to remain credible. Yeah, exactly. That's fascinating. And, uh, yeah, there was so much stuff like that that we've, through, just throughout American history, that we have done. And that's one of the reasons that people... Hate us now. Yeah, and also one of the pe- <laughs> reasons that people don't trust America and that Americans don't trust their government is because we've been doing that throughout our whole history is just feeding out misinformation and doing espionage and things like that. I mean, there's actually an entire, I think it was an AMC show about, um, like Hale and all those people during the revolutionary war who were like the original, like badass spies doing all this stuff throughout long Island and throughout, you know, the new England area of spying and espionage that they were doing. And like, That's, like, so rooted in our history that, like, it's hard not to, you know, maybe it's part of our collective memory that we remember that we were such scumbags in the past (laughs) that we're like, "Mm, maybe we still are, you know? (laughs) Well, look at Hedy Lamarr. I mean, do you know the history? I'm looking at him right now. Do you know the history of Hedy Lamarr? (laughs) Cute guy. She was, that's a woman. (laughs) Oh, well, she was, no, (laughs) she was was considered, like, the great sex symbol movie star of the late 30s and early 40s. And when she was 15 years old, she was in Germany, and this Nazi saw her, and he's like, oh, well, you're going to be my mistress, and just took her off the street and made her his mistress. And she was just basically a sex slave. She's incredibly gorgeous and super intelligent. She's a super genius, or was a super genius. And so she would go to these dinners with all these high-profile Nazis and stuff like this, and she would just absorb, she had a photographic memory, she'd absorb everything they would say, and then finally, once she got enough information and she knew that the war was coming, she went to America and she goes, I have all this information, give me a citizenship and give me, I want to be a movie star and, uh, and I'll give it to you. And they did. And Hedy Lamarr so hated the Nazis because she knew how bad they were. She was trying to figure out, you know how they had the wind talkers, you know, with the Navajos who mm-hmm. th- did the code and, you know, nobody could break the code because they didn't realize it was actually a language. It just didn't have, what, any consonants or something, just a really bizarre language. And they had no idea that they were actually speaking Navajo. It was not code. So they're trying to break it. Yeah. And, and it was very, very effective. Now, the only other code that they couldn't break was a code that Hedy Lamar herself invented. And basically it led to, I think, the um, creation of cell phones. It basically led to it. But she did it. She was at a, like a Hollywood party, I think. And she... Uh, was singing with one of her buddies who was playing the piano or she was playing the piano or something and she was really worried about the fact that the Nazis could break all these codes and the only one, you know, the Japanese couldn't break the the, the other code she didn't know it was Navajo either because nobody knew and um, so she says we need to do a code that the Nazis can't break they keep breaking our code, we have to keep changing it and so she said what if we do it based on music what if it's not words, it's actually notes and each note of a song is a is a letter, is a coded word. And so she actually did something about um, sound algorithms and all this other kind of stuff that actually became a code and they never broke it. (laughs) And Hedy Lamarr thought that up. There's there's a lot of people uh, in our, in like our zeitgeist that were people from World War II. I mean, Coco Chanel, who my dog is named after, (laughs) is, uh, was a Nazi spy. You know, like there's, I mean, like I said, Hugo Boss earlier, like the big start that Hugo Boss got was designing clothes for the Nazis. And, uh, well, Honda and, and all these cars, they were all Japanese. Yeah, and we, don't, Japanese. and we don't really think about that, but yeah, there's so many things that got their start there. Uh, what's his name, uh, who played uh, Count Dooku? was like a huge, uh, was a medic in World War II. He's like, he spent all this time serving in World War II and being in like these important battles. Wow. And uh, now he's well, just, Well, and Captain you know, Kangaroo. Yeah, and we just think of them as actors and regular and Lee people. Marvin. And, yeah. you know, even, uh, even, you know, like, the even after World War II, there's all these people that like were, you know, big military people. And like, we don't think of them as that. We just think of them as the actors today or whatever. Well, it's like you look at Natalie Portman, you have no idea that she's a super genius. You know, she's a super genius. I just find that just fascinating. I love all that stuff. One of the coolest World War II stories was the one about Esther Williams going to visit. You know, she did all those swim movies, 
because she was an Olympic swimmer. And you know all those old movies where they're like swimming and they do the choreographed swimming and stuff like yeah. this? Those were all Esther Williams movies. And she was like this bombshell, right, at the time. And she would, um, stateside, she would go visit all these hospitals. And she was crazy. One of the really great things she would do, she would go and get in the bed with every one of the, the wounded. Every one of them. She'd get in the bed with them. And she'd cuddle and all this stuff. And they loved it. It was great. And she like, would yeah, straddle. Like, yeah, can't wait to get shot. Like, exactly. <laughs> because, because, you know, Esther Williams was going to get in bed with her. <laughs> but the coolest thing that I ever heard of her doing was the doctors came up to her and they said there's this, I think he was like 17, 18 years old, really young kid, and he was shell-shocked. And they said he has not slept for like weeks. He hasn't slept for a long time. And you couldn't touch him. They actually had to hold him down to give him a shot and shit like this. He would just scream. So they said, we know that you get in the bed with him. Just don't, don't, don't get in the bed with him. But if maybe you can come and like sing him a little song or something. Because he's a big fan and he knows you're coming and he's thrilled and we're hoping it'll relax him. So she goes up to him. And she always wore real loose clothing so she could get in the bed with the guys and everything. And she goes, you know, I'm an Olympic swimmer to this boy. And he's, he's, and he's just shaking. And I saw an interview with him. And she says he was just trembling the whole boy was just shaking because he was such a mess. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I know. And she says, my legs are really strong. And she slapped her thighs like this. And she goes, you know, I can really control my legs because they're so strong. He's like, oh, okay. And she says, now, I am not going to touch you. I promise you, I will not touch you. But I am getting in this bed with you. So she puts down the rail. She gets in the bed with this kid. And she's just like, don't, 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 don't touch me. Don't. I'm not touching you. I'm not going to touch you. And she straddled him. And then she starts singing him like a little love song. And she takes her hands, and she put her hands over his face, just like half an inch, for not touching him. And the whole time she's cooing this song to him, she just slides her hand, just not quite touching him, all the way down his arms, all the way to his feet, and back up the whole time she's singing like this, and she never touched him. And they said the kid just went, <sighs> and he fell asleep with her on top of him, never touching him. It's like, um... Isn't that the coolest story ever? It's like Mr. Miyagi. You know, helping uh, know. <laughs> helping Daniel's uh, leg. Which, <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, I believe, was in like an internment camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 during I, yeah. World War II. Same thing with uh, George. George Takei. Ta- yeah, okay. George Takei. He was in an internment camp, and it's like it's it's so wild to think that like that is not that far in our past exactly. that we were just like literally subjugating people and going like, hey, you got you got this kind of eyes. You got this sort of nationality, you're going to be staying here until we know that you're safe. You well, know? Woody Guthrie um, on... And not safe as in your, your safety, as in our safety. As in our safety, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woody Guthrie, um, he always walked around with his guitar, and he just carried it everywhere. And um, he was walking with his buddy when Pearl Harbor happened. And he was, he was in California, and he says there was a Japanese grocery store owned by Japanese Americans... And he said he saw this angry mob, and they're going to go, you know, just wipe out this grocery store. And he says he could see the whole family looking through the window just terrified. And so he, he was like, he, Woody Guthrie always said, music soothes the savage beast. So he jumped up on top of a mailbox, and he starts playing his guitar, and he starts singing, We Shall Overcome. And all the people stopped. There's like a mob, a whole mob. And they all stopped, and they started singing with him, and they started swaying like this. We shall overcome, and they completely forgot that they were going to go kill and destroy <laughs> these people. That has to do with wavelengths and frequencies that are. That's that are exactly soothing. right. Music. Uh, Woo. It's, it's it's all about the C chord with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just suddenly is like, hmm, C major. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah, but it, but yeah, sound is awesome because it could do that. It had that effect. And we talk about resonant frequency. You could destroy a building with sound if it's the right frequency and amplification. Like, well, you know the Aborigines. Um, they always said that the earth had a musical note and that they would play it and they would just play the note over and over. And I think it was F flat or something like this. And once they started doing this sonic technology and researching it, they said that the, that the, the center, the heart of the earth is F flat. And, and so the Aborigines were correct it's as funny to what note it was. It's actually that this uh, constant sound coming out of the earth that we don't notice, that we've completely phased out. Right. There's all this, like, cosmic sound that we just, like, you know, the same way that when you're wearing too much cologne, 
that starts because you got used to that smell over time. We got used to the sound and it's just like we don't even notice it. And there are people who can notice it and like it drives them fucking up the wall <laughs> because they just hear a low It uh, never shuts off all the time. Almost like you're sitting next to your like refrigerator or freezer and just humming in your ear all day and like I can only imagine what that's like. That's gotta be worse than tinnitus, you know? Yeah. I was I was walking with my one friend in Illinois once and she and I were walking her dog and she goes, Oh god, I I'm I'm sick. And I'm like, what? She goes, oh, I'm going to throw up. And she throws up. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, what'd you eat? I didn't eat anything. I'm fine. And then she's like, oh, I got to go home. So I actually had to help her to her car, and I drove her car back to her house, and I walked home from there. And the next day there was an earthquake. And they said that there are a lot of people, you know how animals can sense an earthquake is mm -hmm. coming, and they think it's because of the whatever magnetic frequency or whatever changes slightly before an earthquake, so animals always know. And they said that there's some people who are tuned to that too. And because I was, I was like, why did she throw up right before an earthquake? And it was like the first earthquake in that area forever. I remember I was laying in bed and the whole bed bounced up. And it was in Illinois. And um, it says that these people who feel this get real nauseous and usually throw up right before an earthquake. They said anywhere between um, eight to ten hours before the earthquake actually happens. Hmm. And so I said. Have you ever thrown up before an earthquake before? And she goes, I've never been in an earthquake before. Yeah. <laughs> she goes, I don't know. And that's interesting because that's almost something that you could chalk up to like something, you know, like psychic. But you could also chalk that up to just, you know, before an earthquake happens, you know, there's something leading there's physical, up to that. Right. There's yeah. physical attributes, physical vibrations that you feel. and Which are that can, yeah. Well, I think that, that psychic ability, I think that psychic ability could possibly be the same thing. That they're going to find out, maybe in the future, that it is because they sense this or they sense that. And, you know, didn't Einstein say that he didn't believe, he believed in uh, psychic ability, although he said most people are full of shit. And he says because he, you know, he didn't believe that time was linear. He believed yeah. that it was cyclical. And he's like, why can't someone who's attuned to this turn slightly to the right and see the past and things like this? So that's well, interesting. That's what makes me mad about, I, I guess it's always like the most current time might be the best time for all this type of research, whatever, for everything. Because um, you're always getting closer and closer to it. But that's why I'm mad I'm not going to be alive in like the year <laughs> 4000. Because like... It could be pretty cool. Like, whatever they well, find out, it could be happening. awesome. I'm so mad I'm not going to be around for that. So. Well, you know what's weird is if you read H.G. Wells' books, if you read The Time Machine and you read War of the Worlds, those books are scary as hell. Not because they're actually scary, because they are, but because he mentions stuff that's modern today. He talks about CDs. He talks about um, bomb shelters and air raid sirens. He talks about... Um, Basically, some people think he talks. He describes Earth crust displacement, and all this other stuff, what's and, and it's about, fascinating. Yeah, and what's interesting about those things is H. G. Well was a very intelligent person, right? But there is like this idea, like the same thing with like the popularization of cell phones. They think was because of like the Star Trek um, right. communicator, you know, it and, inspired nerds to create yeah. that. And so, how many of those things did people read H. G. Wells and things like that? And suddenly they were like, oh, that you know, means this. I never that realized means this. I could. Like, this is actually a possibility. And since he was such an intelligent person, you know, like, uh, like Da Vinci had all these ideas that he couldn't pursue because of the physical limitations of the time. Like the helicopter. Yeah, and so... Which he did invent. Which, so they, there's all these things that, you know, even though he could theorize these things, he had no means to pursue them at the time. So now we have these things that we can look back on. And meanwhile, if he hadn't made this into amazing literary works... Um, no one would have been able to because it would have just been the scrollings of a madman. It would have just been a right. guy who's like, by the way, in the future, we could take plastic and we could take discs and we could write on them with light and people would be like, all right. What the fuck are the you fuck talking up? about? <laughs> like, yeah. And so like, yeah. Um, but going back to talking about, uh, you know, sound frequencies and stuff like that, there's um, a lot of these places that are considered like notoriously haunted places. And it's, it's right. They think that there's like, you know, old fans in there that are rubbing against the metal and it's causing these frequencies that all is the exact frequency that your eyes vibrate at or the inside of your ear vibrates at and so if your eyes are vibrating the way we see is we're making composites of what we're seeing so if you've seen something before 
you don't necessarily have to look at it for that long. Your brain knows, okay, that's what that looks like. I'll add that to my composite that I'm making. And so when, if your eyes are vibrating, your your brain like, doesn't know like how to It's like the interpret RAM that. of your brain. And right. so it ends up like basically, if your eyes are vibrating, you'll see shapes that aren't there because you're almost reading it in like in sweeping motions. And so these shapes need to be interpreted into something. And so you can interpret them into, say, the shapes of people and things like that. Um, one thing that I, I will segue that into, um, I am realizing we're getting to like two and a half hours, um, <laughs> which like we thought we were going long last time. Um, the, uh, speaking of haunted places, there's this place in LA, um, cause I know Rebecca will find this fascinating. There was this story about this woman, Kristen Lamb, who she was, um, found in the, um, there was basically a water tower on top of there, and she was found inside of it. The water tower was completely sealed up. And the reason that they found out was because people had been complaining about the smell of the water and that the water was running black. And um, they don't know how she got up there. There's really limited people with access to get her up there, and like it would be very difficult to even do. But the last... And I just, literally just got chills thinking about this. The last moment that they have of her alive, the last evidence of her alive, is a camera from the um man i'm getting so many chills talking about this 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 genuinely freaks me out not many things genuinely freak me out especially when i like see them firsthand you can look at the video on youtube of her he's gonna pull it up of her in the elevator what was her name uh Kristen lamb l-a-m um she was she's from Can canada she's from <laughs> canadian she's from canada i believe she was like korean um and yeah, basically, uh, the last footage is her, it's from the inside of the elevator, and it, she's trying to get the elevator to go, and for whatever reason, it's not going. Reason says that it's just a, you know, a very, very old hotel, and it's in very poor shape. But, so she's, she keeps, like, looking back, and, like, looking around, and, like, she keeps, like, you know, after she tries pushing the buttons to get the elevator to work, she's, like, looking out and looking around the corner. And there's no evidence of what's around the corner. But at one point, she leaves the elevator, and she does this motion with her hands. And the way she does it, some people say it's because of the fisheye of the, the elevator lens. But the way she moves is so not human that it's so creepy that that's, like, the last thing that they, that they have evidence of her doing prior to being found in the water system of this hotel. Is this the video? And she's Korean? I um, believe she's Korean. Well, have you heard that weird thing about Korean men who... I'm finding it. Who Lam, die... L-A-M. Who, like, die of fear and their hair goes white and everything and they have these funerals with these young men and, and they just said that it's like a Korean demon and you're like, what the hell? And they all die from, like, their hearts burst or whatever from terror and, and they just say, oh, yeah, it's a normal thing in Korea. Have well, you ever heard of this? Well, I, I saw it in National Geographic years ago. Well, what's interesting is I was reading about this phenomenon that's very common outside of America, but it's still pretty common in America. Apparently, Elisa Lamb. Lisa Lamb. That's what Elisa. it is. Lisa Lamb. Oh, Elisa. Elisa. Yeah, E-L-I-S-A. Um, sorry. We're going to look that up tonight. And um, Well, he's going to pull it up right now, so you'll get to see the freaky hand motion she cool. does. And there's a lot of re It wasn't too long ago. There's a lot of like people talking about it and what it could have been and all these things. Um, but what was I, what were we just talking about? Um, uh, I don't know. You, you were saying it. <laughs> um, you just brought something up and I was replying to and that. you segued into her that you found fascinating and chilling? Well, either way, the, you know, the, the whole, uh, thing with her is just so fascinating and, uh, it's it's really one of those oh so I was talking about you were talking about the people in Korea who are are found like basically scared to death right there's this um, phenomenon where basically people see these uh, shadowy black figures um, that are like shadowy black clouds and they have red eyes and I was going through this like it was basically a Reddit thread of like creepy things that have happened to you that like you can't explain and so many people in that thread were talking about this specific black cloud creature with red eyes that like it started to really get is to this me. the mothman references no and see that's the thing is that that was when i read the first one i'm like oh it's like the mothman right but no it's like this black cloud some people describe it as having like spider-like legs and like it'll appear over you while you sleep but the thing is i was reading stories about people 
seeing it over other people sleeping. So it's not like a sleep paralysis thing. And the thing is, like I said, I'm a skeptic about a lot of things, but I always find it so interesting when these phenomenons transcend just one, like, isolated group. Like, the Mothman, all of those people could have just heard about the first person saying this creature. Well, no, it's and not then, even just the town. And the then, Mothman goes back thousands of years. And But either way, like, all cryptids go back, like, a certain period of time, and there's no way to know if someone had just heard of that and or is referring to it. Or it could be collective memory as a and, belief. And, yeah, and so, you know... The, the idea of these, like, shadow people, for some reason, is so creepy to me. And here, all these people in succession... Could have also just been trolls on Reddit. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. But no, afterwards, so afterwards, I looked into it, and it's like this whole phenomenon. And that was the first thing I thought. I was now, like, is someone, it a current phenomenon, someone, or is it it's, ancient? It's or? like a long-running thing. And that okay. was the first thing I thought. I was like, all right, someone's, you know, trying to, uh, you know, start their own urban legend or whatever. And then to see, like, all these people referring to that and saying that's happened to them and, like... It's just so strange to to think of. And even if I don't believe in it, it's still enough to, like, you know, freak you out a little bit. Well, my mom would do um, weird things. She could always tell when someone's going to die. It was just a weird thing she could do. And we're just, you know, I grew up with it, so I'm just like, okay, you get, your, get out your black clothes, you know? And um, my dad doesn't believe in that stuff at all. And he goes, but he, he has seen mom do this shit. And I remember one time he goes, yeah, he says... The only one she, she says, she only freaked me out two times when she did that. He goes, one time, and Dad is telling me this, the skeptic. He goes, one time I was watching the news, and you were just a baby. And he says, uh, or maybe you weren't born, I don't know. And he says, um, and then, oh, it's, it's on now. Okay, we're watching uh, Elisa Lamb. Well, I was uh, going to, like, vet it first before, <laughs> before I started talking about it again. Oh, okay. I wanted to get through it. Um, I mean, well, I'm obviously watching without the sound, so I don't know if there was sound in the elevator. That there's, there's no sound. There's oh, no yeah, version security of elevator. Sound. So, yeah. what is a little weird about it, she gets in this elevator, she definitely tries to, you know, pick her floor. The elevator door is not closed at all. I've been, this is, I'm on 5 minutes and 57 seconds. It started at th- 3 minutes about. It's finally now closing. So, She's not in the elevator anymore. And then she's going to, I believe she attempts to get back in the elevator. It, she, there is a point where she is making some weird movements. Okay, so it you did see those weird movements, Yeah, it, right? it doesn't look like, you know, it's not like when you see, like, the Exorcist of Emily Rose or something like that, where it's very exaggerated, but it's a little, it is odd. Um, That's a great movie. It doesn't seem like something you'd just normally do. Yeah, it um, seems, it seemed like such an unnatural movement and something that was, like, Almost like a step before the hands expanding in a, yeah. uh, you know, Werewolf in London, that it was just so uh, and also otherworldly. And now she went it, back in before, like she stepped out and back in a few times. And at one point, it looks like she's just pressing all the buttons because the door's not closing at all. Yeah, and, and then it, she gets out of it, and you don't see her again now. And the door has not moved. They haven't got, hasn't gone to another floor. The door has opened and closed several times. That scared the crap the out of me. Of this so guy, about a four this guy coming back to narrate just scared yeah. the crap out of me. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that's just so interesting, and I've never seen anyone move like that, even so undistorted. I, you know, I've never heard anything about this. It's weird, and it was only published last year. This video, right? it, anyway, it really wasn't that long ago that this I'll happened. Have to look at it. And a friend told me, and he like. He told me in, we were waiting for my girlfriend to get, you know, get something from the house. And he told me in a dark car, and he was freaked out telling me. And I don't consider him a person who's, like, you know, scared of stuff. But, like, it's one of those things that when you see it, it's going to pop back into your head at some point, and you're going to feel uncomfortable. It, it, there is a point where, like, the, like I said, the door wasn't closing, and she goes and she looks out. And then when she gets back in the elevator, she goes into the corner of it. Not like if you walked and made it to the opposite end, and you're deep in the corner waiting for other people to come in, she goes to the corner where the buttons are, like, almost like she's hiding from something. Yeah, and at one point she presses the buttons, and some people place emphasis on, like, the order she presses the buttons in and things like that. Like, maybe there's some sort of, like, you know, secret thing she's doing to do... And it's, you know, who knows what of this is, you know, circumstantial and what of this is, you know, like, relevant. It's just a matter of, like... The circumstances of her death were so strange, and the last, you know, evidence of her existence is so strange that, like, there's this, like, 
shroud of mystery surrounding the whole thing. Go back to where she actually does that movement, though, so Rebecca can see that, because that's that really, for me, was what made it really weird. You know, anytime that you're watching someone do something like this and you're not, like, used to watching security footage, it feels sort of weird, but just the motion she does is so unnatural. And you can see, if you look at it, that it's sort of, you know... It, the, She's all the, pers- right there. the perspective is forced a little bit from the uh, fish eye of the lens. But yeah, and then she ends up coming back in. And uh, I hope there's to, someone... To me, almost the weirdest part is that the fucking elevator just doesn't close by right, itself. Right, right. Yeah, like, exactly. And then all of a sudden... And like, it just keeps opening and closing. Oh, my God. She's so freaky. God, just seeing her makes me uncomfortable. See, she starts pressing it, and people put some sort of thought into the order that she's pressing Yeah, that's buttons. what I'm interested in. Well, the, the thing that my dad was talking about, about my mom was he said he was watching the news, and she's going out the front door. Oh, there she goes. Going out the front door, and on the news it said... Look, look here's look the, yeah, where it starts. Oh, oh like, wow. Almost like... I would almost think it's a seizure if she was, like, on the ground. Yeah, it's almost as if, like... It's like she's listening she's to music up. To There's me. actually some things where her she's hand She's dancing moves. the dubstep right now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> where, yeah. where her hands move in this way that, like... Yeah, look at that. ...just seems so unnatural. Is she like, breaking her own fingers? What's I don't know. Doing? Like, yeah, it's so strange. And I think there might be a slightly higher resolution version of this, because I feel like this got... Because this guy put this in his commentary video or whatever. I think it got downsampled a little bit. But for all I know, this is the the best quality one. And it's just so unnerving and then yeah i think this is about the end of it and yeah. then the, the door is going to start closing which, finally. right which i saw is really fucking weird <laughs> yeah that part is fascinating it stayed open there. for three and a half minutes and then in the last 30 seconds it opened and closes like four times and then so what was also interesting is that there was an amount of time that she was in this thing in this you know uh water reservoir or whatever it was like rotting away that she was able to change the color of the water to black to black and that was the first sign that she was missing no one knew where she was that she was missing prior to that but yeah it's so interesting because if you were getting in this situation a lot of people just say okay she's getting stressed out because the the elevator's not going first world problems man (laughs) but see yeah she does this like glance around the corner which is like such a like that's, that's look at that. And she's hiding. And that's yeah, and weird. she hides in the corner. Okay, have you have they done any research on this? Is she's doing this as a promo for something, and it's all bullshit? No, she's no. really dead. She's no, dead? She really yeah, she's is dead. really dead. This was several years ago, so by now, you know, it uh, come out, yeah. the Alyssa Lamb, the exorcism of Alyssa Lamb would have come out by now, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, you know, I consider myself a skeptic, but things like this always just sort of freak me out. When oh, you look, can, she and just she saw does this there. like. It's and a, a, yeah, this is that was a little weird too. Like yeah, and it's almost like she has some sort of. It's like she's waltzing with herself. And there's so many things that could just be going through her head. Like okay, is there someone around the corner? Okay, maybe there's some sort of sensor for the door. So maybe I have to get into the corner here. Maybe I need to sort of you know maybe she thinks that there's some sort of sensor like the older automatic doors that you have to put weight on something. So that's why she did that little jump there. And so you can put reason to all of it, and then all of a sudden she starts doing that motion, and then I have, for me, all reason. Like, goes I have the no door. reason for that. I get it. But also, so when you're stressed, you know, she she starts pressing these buttons, but she does press it in like a certain sort of motion, a like consistent motion. If I were getting stressed over that, I'd start kind of just like you know fanning my fingers over well, the buttons also, to press them down. I'd also or be interested if the buttons make a noise when she presses them. Hmm. And yeah, you know, it looks like, a, it looks like she's trying it, like, to work with something. Like, it's so... I don't I don't even know. It's so interesting. Yeah. And you have to have a... a to get onto that roof, you would need to have... Oh, fuck. <laughs> Can't believe we're watching this again. <laughs> um, see that, that motion right there with her hands, and then, yeah. like... It almost looks like she's, like, crying and talking to someone, but her hands move in this motion that is just unrealistic. And like you said, it looks like she just starts breaking her fingers. Did they have broken bones in the body? Um, I don't know if the body was in a condition to really say that since well, it was in tell a it was closed reservoir. I'm not really sure, honestly. Right. Um, Apparently, this in the comments, this a few people have said that there were no drugs in her system during the autopsy. Yeah, they said there was no drugs in her system. And just, um, in order to get to that place, you had to have a key to get onto the roof. So it would have to be someone who, you know, had a key for that, worked for the company or whatever. But then, to that point that they would get her 
up there and into the reservoir without anyone noticing is just so Well, surprising. I've had a blast, but I have to go. Let me finish that story about my, my, oh, my mom. Yes. Yeah, because okay. we got all involved with yeah. this. Um, my dad told me this, and he says he's watching the news. She's starting to go out the front door because she's going to go get groceries. And he heard on the news, President Kennedy will visit Dallas, Texas tomorrow. And he says, Mom just stopped. And he says she turned around like a robot, and she didn't look at him or anything. And she just goes, and he will die there. And the next day he was killed. So... So she was in on it. Is what <laughs> exactly. Or, or maybe she was just really conservative, and that was like her threat. Before. She was like, and he will die there. <laughs> well, um, this is wonderful. Thanks for having me. Well, before you go, let us know everywhere we can find out about your book, um, all the other stuff you do. I know you've been doing a comic, and just okay, my, my all, web, your, all my your, your website, art stuff. My website is www.rebeccaodonnell.com. The book is called Freak. The True Story of an Insecurity Addict. I've started an Insecurity Addict um, comic, which is kind of fun. I do Insecurity Addict um, exercises, Insecurity exercises um, on a bunch of social media, LinkedIn. What's uh, your Twitter? Um, capital N, Security Addict. So. Thank you for coming. Yeah, is that your alarm? Fun. Was that your, like, That's oh, nice this fun. is when I have to leave? Yeah, <laughs> yeah Tino going, where um, are you? No, but thank you for coming. Um, I know we could do this literally for another three hours with no problem. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, we'll try to have you again down the road. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it a lot. Very, very, uh, thank you. You know, I was going to say very welcome. Like, wait a minute. No, thank you for coming. <laughs> and as you can tell, I talk incessantly, so it's Yeah, fine. it was great. Um, so let me just... End this right here, then. Um, I, oh, and my I book is available on Amazon. So you there you go. Amazon. And the audio book will be available shortly. Right. Very shortly. Um, oh, and it's also on um, uh, Barnes & Noble website. Cool. Yeah, so if you Google that, it'll come up everywhere. Go to our website. you find everything. Um, I do have a special guest coming, maybe not next week, but in the next few weeks. Uh, my friend Eddie Truck Gordon, he just won the latest season of the Ultimate Fighter of season 19. Um, trains at the gym that I do. Talked to him yesterday. He was like, oh, yeah, of course. No no problem. I'll come down for that. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, I have another friend that's uh, involved in the uh, training and personal training and fight game, too. Um, I might try to get them both to come the same week because uh, I think that would be pretty interesting. But we do have, uh, you know, a good uh, kind of calendar coming up of people um, and always talking to people. So... Anybody interesting, tell them to drop us a line. The email is uh, djtraction at gmail.com. Twitter at djtraction. Um, Mr. Foxy Jackson is going to be my new... Uh, I'm going to try to make that, uh, that trend. I'm going to make that hashtag trend. That's my goal. <laughs> Any uh, last words? Um, we're not Before saying... Before we kill you. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're not saying that Prince is going to be on the show, but we're not saying he's not going to be on the show. <laughs> so stay tuned for maybe the artist possibly formally known as M Kind of Prince. I think he would love this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Good night. We'll see you next time.